Good morning. We will call this work session to order. Thank you for being here. I wanted to move it. I uh, wanted to move this work session down to Citizens Hall so we could have <coughs> enough space this morning. I don't think our uh, conference room really would have held everyone this morning. So this is a nice space and everybody can breathe and relax and have enough air circulating. Um, public comment. Clerk, do we have public comment this morning? Yes, ma'am. You have the form in front of you. Okay. I have the list here. We respect our citizens' rights to address their government in this meeting. However, as the chair, I intend to enforce our three-minute rule in order for this meeting to run efficiently and effectively. Once reached, you will be um, asked to finish your sentence or wrap your sentence up, and then the floor will be taken back by me. Please avoid campaigning or personal attacks against personnel or officials, which should be handled in another forum other than a body um, business meeting of such as this. Uh, we have one, well, we have nine comments this morning, nine uh, citizens who have signed up to speak. The first um, citizen is Heather Dennis. Heather, would you please come forward and uh, <clears throat> give us your address and your subject matter. And just, uh, we have, so you all know, we have a timer on, and in three minutes the timer will go off. Go off, uh, will go off. You have that set, clerk? The, the yes, timer is ready to go. Okay, thank you. Ms. Dennis? Good morning. My name is Heather Dennis. I live off Banks Mill Road in Douglasville, Georgia. My subject matter is buses. Recently, someone told me you will respect your officials. That demand has resonated with me, and I'd like to address it now in the context of the proposed bus system. I start off by declaring that I must and do have tremendous respect for the public offices in this county. If I did not respect those offices, I would never have spent countless hours over the last year researching public documents, leading a Citizens Action Committee, and expressing concern for how those offices are being managed by this administration. That said, I am not required to respect the officials that sit in those public offices. In fact, those officials should earn the respect of the citizens. The evolution of the proposed bus system has caused respect for this leadership to wane. Please allow me to tell you why. Number one, the original grant application contains stretched truths if not actual lies. Douglas City, Douglasville City Council was given 24 hours to provide a letter of support in the application, but declined to do so since they were unfamiliar with the project. Additionally, no true feasibility study was conducted. Number two, the buses will connect to MARTA, despite assurances to the contrary as spoken in the August 14, 2017 BOC meeting. Number three, lawful and or ethical process and procedure has been ignored. On October 13, 2017, the Transportation Committee amended the original grant application, which is a federal document, without a vote by the BOC, and the committee never notified the BOC of this official change to the application. This change has still not been addressed by vote or ratification. Number four, open meetings laws have been violated. A hearing of the Transportation Committee allowing for public uh, comment occurred on March 20th at 5 o'clock p.m. To comment, citizens had to be signed in by 4.45 p.m., 15 minutes prior to start. Notification of the meeting occurred at 4.48 p.m., three minutes after sign up. Number five, thoughtful planning through a feasibility study has not been addressed. How is trash to be managed? Will right-of-ways be an issue? Will land need to be purchased for bus stops? Will sidewalks be needed for the public safety? What agency will provide for public safety, et cetera? Six, annual costs that burden the taxpayers have still not been determined. A feasibility study would have addressed this. Currently, citizens still do not know how much it will cost to ride the bus or vans. These are but a handful of points and examples of the questionable behavior by this board as pertaining to the bus system alone. So the questions that I will close with are, how does this board plan to earn back the citizens' respect? Will you vote to pass the bus system, thus affirming these actions I've listed? Or will you vote to stop the bus system, thereby acknowledging that this board can and will do better for the citizens of Douglas County, thus taking a step forward to earn back the respect of your constituents? Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Dennis. We'll take the, uh, your concern under advisement. Uh, next, we have Ms. Don Ray Leonard. Ms. Leonard, would you please come forward? And give us your address, please, for the record and uh, your subject matter. Don Ray Leonard. I live off of Bomar Road in District 2. My subject matter is the buses. Okay. These are quotes from Commissioner, Commissioner Mitchell from earlier this year in a work session. 
I just want to read them back and refresh your memory on some of the things that you said. This transportation project evolved from the senior citizens and disability type of a makeup to this vast makeup of what we are dealing with today. The evolutionary side of this has been kind of interesting from the financial side of it to the roots, even to the number of buses. But my concern, as I've stated, is the process. The transparency and the honesty of what we're dealing with when we talk to our citizens. My concerns have recently arrived just from the mere fact of the changing of the project. That's where I've had some concerns. I don't know who or how, I don't, and not anything against Gary, but when did it change? Why wasn't any of us notified who made the change? You also said. Because I know throughout my coffee and conversations, these guys ask me to make sure you know what you're speaking of. Make sure you know that the statement you made is absolutely true. But here's something else that you might want to take a look at. So I did. The whole timeline, I found some things that I thought were very interesting that I did not know about. I did not know there was a change. Madam Chair, I think we've got to start being honest with the citizens of Douglas County and being transparent with them first. That's where I've had an issue. If we're going to be transparent, we've got to be honest and open throughout the process. We can't make changes, whether it's a change for the good, whether it's a route, whether it's finances or anything. This project is too big to the citizens of Douglas County just to make changes and then we find out about it later. Yes, I've had some concerns with this project. Then you said, I've got to, I've got to first think about the transparency and the honesty to those whom I serve as to what I articulate first. Understand that the process is known to the public and it's not just something that I just want to make a change or I'm just doing it to benefit my constituency, just District 1. No, it's got to be good and it's got to be for the entire county versus a section of the county. I'm off keel on the mere fact that the busing system, based on the information of my research as to what I actually know now as fact. So for the personal gain for those who made the changes, I just can't get on board until we are honest and transparent with those whom we serve. Commissioner Mitchell, have you found that honesty and transparency yet? Have you found it, Madam Chairman? Have you found it, Commissioner Robinson? We're waiting. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ms. Leonard. We'll take this. Um, your concerns under advisement. Next, we have Ms. Kathy Beveridge. Ms. Kathy, would you please come forward and give us your address, please, and uh, your subject matter this morning. My name is Kathy Beveridge. I live on Punkintown Road in Douglasville, Georgia. Mm -hmm. My subject matter is the CMAC vote for the bus, for the proposed bus van routes. Whether you're a Democrat, Republican, black, white, Hispanic, or a beautiful mixture, all of us make up Douglas County. All of us should care about our county and how our tax dollars are spent. All of us should use common sense regarding fiscal issues in our county. In late January 2018, our district state representative, Micah Gravely, requested a comment of the fees, a, a, requested a copy of the feasibility study for the proposed bus van system due to concerns which were brought up by many citizens regarding no feasibility study being performed. As of Friday, July 20th, 2018, per information received from Mr. Watson, no actual feasibility study is available. A needs study was performed which does not compare to a feasibility study. I need a Mercedes but I'm not going to purchase one without determining cost, interest rate if applicable, and operating cost, including fuel and maintenance. I need a mansion with 10 bedrooms and a beautiful pool, but I'm not going to purchase it without the price, knowing the price tag, cost to maintain, and many other variables which would in, impact my budget. I'm not going to purchase it and expect Douglas County taxpayers to chip in and pay for a luxury that only a finite, extremely small number might benefit. Why is our BOC planning to implement a bus system without knowing the true cost? 
why are you considering a vote to purchase something that will surely place an undue burden on the taxpayers of Douglas County? Currently, only an estimated operating cost is available and does not even include vehicle fuel and maintenance cost. Had a feasibility study been completed, certainly maintenance and fuel cost would be included, as well as items such as new sidewalk cost, bus shelters at stops, purchasing right-of-ways, additional wear and tear on our already in poor conditional roads, cost to, ma to maintain the bus stop areas, et cetera. There are, these are just items that common sense says will add additional cost. The experts would undoubtedly have an extended costly list. Why would you buy that Mer Mercedes or that nice mansion without doing your financial homework first? Our needs versus our wants can often get confused. Somewhere along the way, that need for a two-route system for the elderly and disabled changed into a want for a four-route system that includes wandering outside the county. I respectfully and prayerfully ask that you vote no to, this, to the acceptance of the CMAC grant for the proposed bus system and that you are consider for those that you are are considering this, you have have no idea of the cost and negative impact to the taxpayers of, of Douglas County. Let's bring common sense back to the table. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Beveridge. We will take this matter under advisement as well. Uh, next, we have Ms. Kelly Hunter. Honey, I'm sorry. Ms. Honey, please come forward. Uh, give us your address and your subject matter. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Kelly Honey. I live at uh, 7897 Rio Grande Trail, and I'm here today to express my opposition and frustration regarding the proposed bus system. I feel it is extremely irresponsible for our Board of Com Commissioners to accept this federal grant due to the passage of the ATL Transportation Bill this, this year. The Transportation Committee has steamrolled this bus system through even knowing the ATL bill was being discussed and voted on in the legislature. Even House and Senate members, Micah Gravely, Jay Collins, and Mike Dugan of the Georgia legislature expressed concerns of this board continuing the process. The ATL gives, gives the, or the ATL bill gives the opportunity to the citizens to vote on the transit systems for their county through a T-splast. It allows the voices of the citizens to be heard instead of commissioners telling us what we need and how it is now time to get their pet projects fulfilled. Also, allowing a minute percentage of the population to dictate whether we need a bus system does not help the greater good of this county nor any citizen in it. It has been stated by the chair <coughs> that if this does not work in three years that the program can be scrapped and the buses would be put into the county fleet. This means that $4.6 million of federal grant money and $3.6 million of local county money would be wasted. Let me explain that better for you. That is $8.2 million of tax money collected from hardworking citizens like myself and other people in this room, as well as people across the country. The people that are elected are supposed to be good stewards of the money they are entrusted with during, during their tenure. I would not say wasting $8.2 million is being a good steward to that money, nor to the hardworking people that provided it to you. It is proven that mass transit is not viable around <laughs> Metro Atlanta. The link system in Cobb County is underwater, and MARTA is constantly floating in the red. The Greta system in our own county has shortfalls. Ridership is down. Follow any bus and see how many people actually ride them. Numbers do not lie. I am a person that believes in small government and that people should pay their own way. So the bus system is not something that I agree with. But I'm also a person that can come to the table and compromise. The original bus system had two inter-county routes for the elderly and disabled. That is a system 
that could be palatable for me and most citizens. What we have now is a gross complication of a simple system. The bad thing is that it continues to change. You are all voting on a system that nothing is concrete. It is like shooting a moving target and you have no pro a high probability of getting it wrong. So I ask these questions to you. When does the voice of the people get heard? When do our elected officials actually listen to the citizens that elected them? And will you hear us today? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Honey. We'll take this matter under advisement. Next, we have Mr. Larry Pierce. Mr. Pierce, would you please come forward and give us your subject matter and your address for the record. Well, 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 let's see here. Got to change the topic, but I am wearing a red shirt, so I guess you know what that means. Now, you know, for almost a year and a half, I've made it my business to let you know what your business should be. Now, last week, I asked for some simple records from the corner. Let me show you something. This is what we've been using for 25 years, okay? It's called an investigative worksheet. Now that word in itself tells you what it's about. This is what it changed to. A little bit of information, but not much. So let me tell you what I asked. Quote, the record department received an open records request from Larry Pierce for investigative worksheets or documents like the records that existed previously that would show the location of the investigation and who pronounced the death, whether it be a member of the coroner's office, a doctor or nurse, so that he can compare the worksheets with the invoicing records from May 15th to June 15th. He provided the following names. Now, let me show you how short and sweet she replied. And that was on July 17th, so it's not old hat. On the next day, July 17th, Ms. Godwin replies, Aubrey, we no longer use investigative worksheets. Everything is done electronically. Now, isn't that amazing? Are we saving any money? No. Are you going to put it in A, B, C, D? So now you've got to go search A, B, C, D. Let me tell you what this is about. This is about hoodwinking. This is about deceiving me, deceiving the open records request, and deceiving you people. Now, one of you, Mr. Kelly said a while back when I was chewing over the situation. He said, maybe somebody should sit down with her and explain something to her. Well, she ran for the job. Now, if one of you want to go sit down and talk to her, go ahead. Go have some milk and cookies and tell her what her job consists of. But let me further tell you something right here real quick. Right here, this is what's going on, OK? Now, nobody knows what is going on until somebody brings it up. Person was 70 years old, pronounced by a doctor. Don't need a deputy. Person was 72, pronounced by a doctor. Don't need a deputy. Person was 86. She died at an address in Paulden County. Not even our jurisdiction. But our deputy took care of it. Got paid $175. Mr. Pierce, now you won't have time to read the entire list. OK, can I make one last yes. sentence? Yes. You know, 88, 75, the silent majority is tired. I'm tired. And we all get tired after we retire. But some of us don't ever retire. And if the silent majority, if you can hear them, please start paying attention on taxes and quit making up poppycock, because that's what a lot of this is. Thank you so much, Mr. Pierce. We'll take this matter under advisement as well. 
Uh, next, we have Mr. Roy Sparks. Mr. Sparks, could you please give us your address and your subject matter? Roy Sparks, Driscoll Drive, Winston, Georgia. Good morning, Commission Chair and Commissioners and taxpayers. As DCPAC set in meetings with attorneys, we laid out documents from the BOC Resolution CMAC TIP application, which when submitted was two in-county routes. To the document showing where the Transportation Committee had voted to have Gary Watson submit an amendment to the CMAC TIP application, which was four routes, including going through Cobb County H and to H.E. Holmes Marta Station. This submittal was done without BLC approval. The Transportation Committee is a recommending body. They grossly overstepped their authority. Leadership has chosen to allow such. As every document lay on the table in front of the attorneys, both attorneys' comments were, if the Douglas County BOC accepts the CMAC grant without ratifying the four routes, there is a problem. If BOC ratifies the four routes and accepts the CMAC grant, then the BOC can clear matters up with backdoor politics. A vote to ratify the four routes is a vote for backdoor politics. A vote to accept the CMAC grant from the amended CMAC TIP application without BLC approval is a vote for backdoor politics. We will soon know who the backdoor commissioners are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Sparks. We'll take this matter under advisement as well. And last but not least, Mr. John Tomaski, please come forward, give us your address and your subject matter. Good morning all, John Tomaski, 2929 Post Road, Winston. Um, I'm going to speak on the matter of county governance and in this regard I will reference, for example, the remarks of the first speaker, which I found, uh, at least in terms of presentation, to be especially articulate and well presented. Uh, the Georgia Constitution refers to county government authorities, and the state law, of course, uses that same language. Many counties have boards of commissioners. However, some counties have boards of commissioners where the chairman is elected separately from the district commissioners. Some have boards of commissioners where the chairman is elected by the district commissioners. That is, the chairman is one of the district commissioners. There are models where, in either event, the commission retains a county administrator or a county manager, and there are models where there are, in fact, some counties which have neither, and those responsibilities are undertaken by one or more of the commissioners. So I am suggesting that perhaps the commission, when it reconvenes again in January with different membership, consider looking at the overall spectrum of organizational models, models of governance, because as I've mentioned previously and uh, recently uh, in a meeting with one of you, when you have more structured processes, you have less miscommunication and less confusion. Democracy is a somewhat messy process, and it can be more or less messy depending upon the structures and processes which you have in place. And I think the remarks of the first speaker indicate that. 
Consider, for example, at the Olympics, a sprint. And it's an open field race, no lanes. So you can imagine they're taking off at great speed, possibly bumping into each other, pileups, all that sort of thing. So to avoid that, they have lanes. But it would be possibly more interesting to the spectators to see pandemonium on the field. If TV viewership goes up, sort of advertising rates, which is good for the broadcasting companies. So again, consider whether you want to have lanes or not. I'm not advocating anything other than that you look at it and consider the alternatives in the light of the evidence. If what you are hearing from other people this morning is fine, then that's fine. If it's not, then you might want to change when you have, in January, the next complement of commissioners. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Damascus. Oh, and uh, for your Tomaski. benefit, I would point out item five. There are some words Mr. apparently Mr. missing. Mr. Tomaski, you have exceeded your three minutes. Okay, if you'd rather not know. Number five, we, we, we have a, we're prepared for number five. Thank you. We have two presentations this morning. We have a SPLOST update. Um, Mr. Rich Belang, would you please come forward? Rich is not here today, okay? Good morning, Madam Good morning. Chair and members of the board. So my name is Terry Gable. I'm with Moore and Altabelli, and I'll, I'll be presenting the July SPLOST report. And we'll get started. Um, this is a slide that Rich has been showing uh, each month, and it pretty much shows the project cost by program element, which isn't changing. Most of them are, are maxed out except for transportation, and as we move forward, we'll continue to program more projects, and you'll see that number go up, in which it has uh, this month with us adding a couple intersecting sections to it. So right now, we're at about $9.3 million, which is about 10% of the overall program, and we're, we're, we're getting some work done, and we're moving forward with it with the program. Uh, the next three slides just break it up by, by departments. Uh, EMS and public radio, we're about 4.2 million. Good bit of that money is in the, obviously in the fire trucks and the radio system. <clears throat> next uh, is transportation, uh, right at 3.8 million. Resurfacing program is doing well. We just uh, let out the, the 2018 resurfacing uh, and also getting involved in, in some of the intersections. So hopefully that'll, that'll pick up some pace here soon. And then last is parks and recs. Uh, right now is on the low end, but we've got a lot of design work going on with parks and recs. Um, a lot, lots out there, it's just a matter of getting them. We just recently let something on the street for construction. So we're, uh, we're moving forward quite well with that. And then last but not least is the program management expenses for the year, 887,000. So with that, we'll, um, we'll talk about the revenues. The good news for the uh, for month of May, the uh, revenues were up. Um, and you can see the, the flat line is the, the estimated revenue, uh, just a little over $2 million. Uh, the April revenues were down, just below the, the, the projected revenues. And then we're slightly above this much, which, which is good news. Hopefully we'll continue uh, with that pace and see some, uh, some more months that are going to stay above that flat line. This is just another uh, graphic of, the, of April and May um, showing the differences. Of course, we've, we've exceeded uh, last month's revenues. And we'll continue to post that on up and hope, hopefully we'll, we'll stay to the right of the, of the chart there. Uh, just raw numbers there uh, with May at a little over $2, $2 million in revenue. Uh, the estimated revenue for uh, uh, for the two months was low of four million, so we've got a shortfall of average shortfall of about twenty-one thousand dollars, which is at this point in time is minimal. And like Rich keeps saying, there's really no change that we would recommend in, in the overall program. Um, bond obligations, as we did last year, we're making two payments again. This one obviously is going to be larger, uh, one in October and then the other one in April, uh, totaling about seventeen point 
$7 million and everything is on track to make that payment uh, in October. So with those, we'll move into some project updates. Uh, the, the radio system, uh, Motorola's moving along quite well. Uh, just to kind of give you a summary of the towers, we have eight new towers that are going to be built. Uh, four of those are in some form of land acquisition. Uh, three of them are under design, and that's uh, Fire Station 5, 11, and Bill Arp. Those will be the ones that, that J&M will start first. Um, he anticipates about a month and a half on each, but the, the design on them are, is, coming to, is coming to near completion, and they should start maybe hitting the ground with those in about two weeks. They've already done some clearing on some of the lots. Um, Jay, uh, we will have Jay back in August to give a, about a 10 minute more thorough update of the radio system um, in which we, we had, him, had him in a couple months ago too. So with that, the, the one that's, we, have, we do have one that's completed and that's the one over at the 911 center. Uh, this is one of the smaller towers, it's a little over 100 feet. Um, the ones at uh, the other three locations I mentioned will be the, the taller ones at 300 feet. But J&M, again, did, did, did a good job. When I pulled up there, I couldn't even tell that, that any construction had, had occurred there. They, they did a good job of dressing it back up, and, and again, they're, they're doing a good job. And I'm sure they will on the other locations. Um, the ambulances, the chief has two on order and should be coming in um, near by the end of the year. Uh, one, one pumper truck this year, the RFP, the proposal is out on the street now, and we're expecting that back in August the 3rd, and we can get that, that, tr uh, that fire truck under, underway. Fire Station 3. So we finally, we took bids in, uh, in June, on June 15th. We got six bids. Uh, all of them were very competitive. Uh, it did come in a little bit higher in our engineer's estimate as we had expected. Uh, but it was lower than what our, our first rounds of bids were. And it's on the, uh, the, this month's approval to move forward with, uh, with that contractor. So we're looking forward to getting started with that. Uh, as soon as we get some paperwork completed, we'll, we'll have a kickoff pre-construction meeting and get that project underway. Uh, staff vehicles uh, for, for the chief is, I think, three vehicles that should be in by the by the end of the year, and those are on order. So with that, we'll move into transportation. We just recently had a pre-construction, or Miguel's office did with, with the resurfacing program. C.W. Matthews is again the contractor this year. Um, all they need to do to, to get everything finalized with the contract is just sign some papers and get some other information in. The, the, uh, the time frame in the contract is five months, so they got a short fuse on it. But uh, it will be later in the year before CW gets, gets started. They, like all the other contractors, are very busy and they have a lot of work going on. So he says it'll probably be towards the end of the summer or maybe early fall before they can get started on it. But he did promise, he'd, promise us he'd get it. They thought they could get it completed by the end of the year. Riverside Parkway. So all the lights are, are up. Um, and we, I think we reported that last month. The problem that we, or not a problem, but the, the status of it was that not, the power was not to, to all the lights. Um, I talked to Greystone, I finally got in touch with them last week, and they're out there building, last week and this week, they're building risers to, to provide, to feed all the lights on the project. They're supposed to be done by Friday, is what they promised me. So we are staying on them and, trying, and pushing them, but hopefully this will be the last time you'll see this report, uh, report on, on the, the, the lighting on Riverside, and it'll be completely 100% burning and done. Uh, the Lee Road extension is on track um, to be completed around October with their deliverables that they'll be submitting to the county for review, so no change there. Rockhouse Road is the only reason we still have this on here. We have, I think, one invoice to pay, but this project's completed, and I'm sure it will be taking it out for after this month. Stuart Mill Road, we, uh, we're in the process of engaging Jacobs in, in trying to set up a, a kickoff meeting. They're ready to go to work and start surveying the, the intersection. We had to finalize the paperwork for the contract, and as soon as, that done, and as, soon as that's done and I get the uh, kickoff meeting set up with them and Miguel, 
uh, we'll get this project started and hopefully have it designed quicker because if you remember they had already done some design work on this intersection. Uh, John West Road, uh, this is one of the intersections that SEI has. Uh, they've, uh, they're doing a real good job. I, I love the way they communicate with us in Miguel's office uh, to make sure everything is moving, but the design is completed on it. Uh, we're in a, a right away phase for it. It's in Miguel's office. Uh, there's, there's a few easement parcels and a, I think maybe a small right away take. Uh, Miguel is estimating about three months. So once we get the, the right away acquired, we should be letting this project sometime in, in, in late fall and we'll get it out on the street. Chapel Hill Road, uh, they've been working on both these projects concurrently, but mainly on John West. Um, the design obviously is, is, is ongoing. What they're, they're working on right now is to get, get Miguel and I a, uh, some displays. We're gonna do a public, public information meeting out on the project somewhere and set that up maybe next month and be able to invite all the, the property owners in or around the area and uh, go over everything with them, get any comments and make any adjustments at that point. But they're, uh, they're anticipating completing design on this project still with that uh, sometime October, uh, late October to complete the design on it and then we'll go into right away uh, negotiations. Sweetwater Church. Um, so we're, I, about every week I'm calling Pauline County trying to get updates on, on the design uh, for the roadway. Uh, they, they have finished what they say is, is a revised set of plans and we've got a meeting set up July 31st with Miguel's staff to go over everything and, and hopefully get this project to a point where we can start right away negotiations and get out there and, and get the intersection done. I know it's something everybody uh, typically brings up, but we, we're working very close with Paulding County and trying to push them to get it finished. The signal plans are done, which is a, it was a step in the right direction. We had to get that done to finalize anything that happened with the right of way at that intersection. So we're moving forward and hopefully after the next meeting in July 31st, we'll, we will um, have some set plans on moving forward. The next, these are the next two intersection projects that uh, Miguel's office, Highway 5 at Douglas Boulevard and Highway 92 at Anawakee, both are, uh, are needing uh, some preliminary um, studies for scoping and budget. Uh, and that's, what, that's where we're at right now. I think Miguel's gonna be bringing some inf information back to you on, on Highway 5 as far as possible looking at some, uh, some other forms of funding for that project. But again, we're trying to establish scope and budget and uh, particularly with 92 and Anawakee. Um, and then we'll, we'll be bringing that information to you to uh, brainstorm and, and make some decisions on possible options for both of those. Post Road Bridge at Dog River. It's a, uh, GDOT uh, left that project in June and Wright Brothers Construction was awarded the contract. The kickoff meeting they'll be holding, GDOT along with the contractor will be holding a kickoff meeting soon with all the counties that are involved in it. If you remember, the, this bridge was packaged with uh, some other counties and other bridges. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was good news. They've got the contractor on board. We'll have the kickoff meeting and once we have that, uh, I'll be able to report to you a, a schedule at that point so that I know there's a detour going to be involved and we'll get some definitive schedules from the contractor when he's going to start and, and when, he, when he'll be in Douglas County. So the next three are our uh, sidewalk projects, Lithia Springs, Chestnut, and New Manchester. Uh, SEI has that contract and Miguel and I have already had a kickoff meeting. We had to establish some limits to make to clear up any confusion as far as where the sidewalk was going to start and start and I'm sure that as we move forward with design that that could potentially change some but it was a good productive meeting with them and they're ready to go we needed to get them a signed contract which they, they should have by now so we're we're in the early design stages of both all three of those projects and be reporting on those as we move forward And last but not least, with Miguel's equipment, we're, um, Miguel's getting a couple of dump trucks and, a, and a, I think a pickup truck, and I think those are on order, and hopefully he'll have those by the end of the year. So with that, we'll move, last but not least, in the parks. Uh, Boundary Waters Concession. 
building. We, we put it, we received bids July 13th. We, we had a pre-bid on this project and we got in several contractors, probably six or seven. Uh, it was cut down some when the bids were actually turned in. Uh, it, they are over the engineer's estimates, so we're, we're reviewing those, the committee is, and we'll have those probably next month uh, recommendations for the Parks Committee to review and make some decisions on moving forward with that. Um, and that's the, the rendering that we submitted uh, to the Parks Committee for review. Of course, we move forward with it, but this will set just between the soccer field and the football field, and you'll have a concession on one facing one field and the concession on the other. So it's a nice looking building. It'll look real, real good out there in that, in that area. Deer Lick uh, Tennis Courts. So it's, it's on the July uh, agenda to be approved for Carter and Watkins. And we've already had a, a semi-preliminary kickoff meeting with them and they're ready to move forward with that just as soon as uh, everything's they have a notice to proceed and, 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 and a contract in hand. They're ready to move forward with, with Deer Lick Tennis Courts. Our big one, the Multipurpose Rec Center. So we've, we've met several times already with Pete Sutton, with Sutton Architects. Uh, Pete's doing a real good job of trying to keep us within budget and within scope of this project. Uh, and we're already seeing some things that, I guess, bringing reality to it. So we've got you know, we've got our budget of seven million with about 25,000 square foot building. And what he is starting out with is what he refers to as block plan uh, presentations and phase. And that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, and we've gotten all the comments and we, I think Gary's putting together what we're putting together, what we feel like is, is going to be the, the, the best we can do with the, with the budget and the square footage. And probably we need to bring that to the parks committee at some point to get some comments and feedback from them before we, we cut him loose. But the thought is, is to get, get, it, get a preliminary uh, design phase completed and next month possibly have a, a public hearing somewhere in the, in the general area. And, and again, we'll do two of those, uh, get the first one and, and uh, also get some public feedback so that we can, we can finally get a final layout to Pete and he can, he can start moving forward with the design on the, on the building. The Senior Center, Carter and Watkins got that uh, and it's been awarded. We've got a kickoff meeting uh, also on July 31st at 2 o'clock at the Woody Fight, Woody Fight Senior Center. So we're looking forward to that. I think Carter and Watkins will do a good job with that, with that project. They, they know the county well and, and, and um, uh, I think will get us a good building. The, the next two is Bill Arp and, and Fair Play in the next slide. Uh, both these parks are getting new concession buildings and uh, some fencing improvements, again, based on budget and scope. Uh, but we're focusing right now on the concession buildings. Um, we're, we're real close. He's real, uh, this is Alan Bell's close to finishing the design on these. We're about 80 to, 80 to 90 percent complete. He's finalizing some numbers on the concession building, which is going to, is, is what we need to make some decisions on the fencing too. So we'll probably be bringing that to the Gary Will to the Parks Committee. Once we get some hard numbers in, and again, I think that's going to take some discussion and review uh, to keep that keep that project within uh, scope and budget. Fair play, uh, fair play park lights and replacements. We've we brought this up because of the condition of the poles. Uh, we're working right now. I am with with Los, uh, we, to put together a, a small set of plans and specs. And we'll be, this has got its own budget, so this project should go out real quick on the street. Uh, but it's, we've, we've certainly moved it up and, and our attention and focus is to get it, get it led as soon as possible. Mr. Lane's equipment gear has already got some equipment in with mowers and uh, I think he's got a pickup order, but. Uh, some of the equipment is already in and he should be close to getting, um, well, by the end of the year, should have everything he needs. And then the last slide is the program management expenses and we're tracking those on a monthly basis based on our, our um, PO. 
So with that, that concludes the update on the, the SPLOS revenues and the projects. I got a couple quick slides that we, we've done before with vendors. Um, we're at 51, current 51 uh, vendors, 16 are within Douglas County, uh, 15 in that 30 mile radius that we track, and then the other 20 are outside of that and, and a few that are even outside of the state. Uh, we're still tracking at about 60% of the vendors are, are within Douglas County or within that 30 mile radius. So we're, we're kind of hang, we're hanging in there and, right, and it hadn't changed a lot from the previous presentation. So we're all tracking it and as work picks up, uh, I'm sure you'll see some changes in the, in the local vendors. Um, so these are, this is a slide we've shown before. It's showing most of the local vendors that are within Douglas County. They've got a lot of the smaller contracts um, but what, we, what I've done is, is, is change the chart up a little bit and we, it's split up now into the, the contractors or vendors that are outside of, of the 30 mile radius. The 35% is the ones that are inside, inside the 35% radius and then 4% are the ones that are actually in Douglas County. We had several contractors <clears throat> that came in <clears throat> and bid on the, uh, the fire station and uh, Boundary Waters concession stand. They just didn't get it. So the word's getting out there. We're getting, we're getting, people are being more aware, contractors more aware of the program. And obviously the program's just getting started and they, and they know that we got more work to come. So the word's getting out and I hope, you know, we'll see it and continue to push and try to get more local vendors in, uh, involved in the SPLOS program. And this last slide is, is, a, is a percentage of the projects that, that we, have, we have on file now that are minority companies. Right now, we're about 16% of those companies that are, uh, and these are general contractors, the, the prime, so to speak, uh, that are minority contractors. We, we don't have the data to collect. To, you know, a lot of contractors may have subs that work for them that are minorities, but that information we don't have available. But right now, we're at 16% of the, of the vendors and contractors are, are minorities. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll close and open it up for discussion and questions. Okay, thank you so much for a great presentation. That was very good. Um, any questions from the Board Chair. of Commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Robinson. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Let's, let's give voice to some of this. All right, so real quick, um, um, three things. Okay. Um, sidewalks. Um, and and I'm, I'm going to make reference to this on the list at the bottom, and this is to Miguel Valentin. Let's make sure we bring up at our next transportation committee meeting, not tomorrow, but the fact of um, the Maxim Road um, sidewalk that we put on the list. Uh, we had a meeting this past Friday with um, Cobb County, and it was a topic that came up during our transportation, I won't call it a summit, but it was a meeting between the two administrations, and that was a point that was brought up that was still a concern. Uh, we've had a couple, you may not know, but we've had um, pedestrian to um, um, vehicle deaths there, and it's something that needs to be addressed. And it was also brought up on Riverside. We, we sh share um, um, a jurisdictional line with Cobb County, and so they likewise follow those things that happen here, et cetera. So we want to make sure we get that on the list. That's just future okay. to address, Miguel. Thank you. Second thing I want to talk about is um, obviously Riverside. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that, you know, I'll speak for myself is that to only advocate that which the citizens have asked for. Nothing more, nothing less. There's nothing that's been advocated that has not, cannot be tied back to a citizen. All right. Volume is irrelevant. Some kind of way there was a need established. Um, as it relates to the lights, this is something that, this, again, this is not you, I'm more expressing for the record. Um, for the citizens who, who, who advocated for this, who asked me to bring this before the Board of Commissioners to put it on the list, it's been, what, a year to put up these lights. And it was such a grueling process. And some of the commentary was, well, we didn't think this was a priority. And I'm like, well, who are they talking to? Right? How, how, how does stuff get out, you know, turn sideways? And this is, we'll get more into that in probably the next couple of days. But it's one of those where, well, wait a minute. This was a priority. This was acknowledged, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged to see that it's coming along, but at the same point, it was like, this was outsourced. I get hurricanes. I get that the primary, the prime, Greystone was, you know, doing other things. I mean, helping 
on those jurisdictions that are, you know, territories and so forth. So they were depleted with their, their core resources. But this was outsourced to a firm that, well, bandwidth and capacity is not your issue. So it's just this experience. And I'm just establishing for the record, though it is being fulfilled, um, the lights will eventually come on and stay on. It's just one of those, like, it's, it's just the experience that we had to go through with yes. this. Um, and I wanted to make that for the record. But hopefully that'll, that'll come to pass here soon and we can sort of celebrate that. Uh, I'm going to go to Deer Lake. Not, um, no, let's talk about Boundary Waters. Okay. Um, this, this concept of a mega park is something that has always been important, um, uh, I think, as a commission. Uh, I'm going to speak to the prior administration toward this one that basically embraced this concept that says these small passive parks, though they're, they're good, there's also a place. Not either or. There are places such, such as Pumpkin Town that was mentioned earlier and passive parks that, that um, should be embraced, but at the same point, mega parts. We have a very small footprint. We're not Cobb, we're not Fulton, right? So the 199 square miles is something that we have to acknowledge. And so we've got this mega park. Um, and in this mega park, we've got you know, baseball, we've got soccer, we've got football, we've got aquatic center. Now we're building this community center, which is to build it out, right? That, that's supposed to be the model where um, a family can come and all their needs can be met, right? Because everybody, do, everybody doesn't play baseball. Everybody doesn't play soccer, right? There's different needs within a community. They all need to be acknowledged. And so that park speaks to sort of what the, the ecosystem here in the county, anybody needs can be met. Everybody doesn't, I mean, again, we're building up basketball and everybody doesn't play basketball. I mean, never play basketball. It doesn't mean that the needs shouldn't be met. Right? I mean, it's like, okay, you got 35,000 kids that's in the school system, right? Five high schools. Only 15 guys get to play basketball per high school, right? Think about it. I'm bringing my point. Um, so when I think about this, this center that's being created, and your point was based on, and, and that, that was background to get to this point of the numbers. We allocated a certain amount of numbers, and I'm, I'm sure Commissioner Mitchell will, will clarify, and it's not a point of how much per se, but there was some functionality that was supposed to be fulfilled, right? Um, in essence, there were some core, and I just need validation for the record, that, and, 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 and uh, uh, if Director Dukes is here, be prepared, that there was supposed to be two um, basketball courts. Um, but it, it was based on the Smyrna Atlanta model, um, uh, recreation center, and at least the concept that came forth. And this, this, this came out of the Anawake community. In essence, that's pretty well documented, that side. And again, I'm glad that you're going to go out to the community in that immediate area and get feedback, as you said you would do. But with that, there was also supposed to be, um, um, and, and I bring this up again because we were at the epicenter, and, and that is the epitome of a community center um, over there off of Riverside. But you've got this center, and it's supposed to have some, some um, rooms, I'm going to call them secondary rooms, to allow us to do um, dance, um, some other things. And I just, I, I want to be careful that the expected that it didn't get compromised some kind of along the way, the functionality. Can we bring Director Dukes up? Because I want to, I, I need an official record, Madam Chair. Yes, he's coming up, yes. Okay. And, and, and again, I recognize that there's a, a certain dollar amount that we've gotten. I, please understand, I understand economics, I understand inflation, I understand the effect on that and uh, what their end result may be. But can you speak to the general functionality and, and what you guys wind up, I heard 25,000 square feet, I recognize that the committee will, will make that determination because if we only got a dollar, we only got a dollar. Can you speak to that, please? Uh, certainly. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Director Dukes. The initial concept, as you as you spoke, uh, was to have two gymnasiums, yes, and then have assorted program rooms okay, for exercise, for dance, for art, whatever programs that the community, and these would be multi-purpose rooms, so you could have one program one day, and hopefully have another program the next day or whatever. And there was also uh, in that proposal a community room. 
so we could have meetings at the park uh, in the community room at the recreation center. And that community room would seat a certain number of people. Uh, what we're finding out is that when, and this is almost on every project we're looking at, the cost of per square foot has increased about 20 to 25 percent since these uh, estimates were made three or four years ago when the economy was down. So what we're trying to do now is massage the uh, design to try to get as much <coughs> as we can. Uh, and, and we don't know. I mean, uh, the uh, design people are saying that's the, uh, what's happening now, 20 to 25%. But until we go out to bid and actually get a firm price, uh, we, we won't be sure as to how many of those extra rooms that we'll be able to put into the recreation center. Okay. And, all right, I, and I appreciate that. And again, I won't belabor this because I know my peers want to get into some other things. This, this is my third one, and I, I, I committed to that. It, to that point, and this is to you know, um, Commissioner Mitchell, just is chairman of that, just be sensitive that when, and, and Gary, this is to this point, um, like Mount Carmel and the problem that we had there when we had an 80-yard football field, and it was not very uh, conducive to um, uh, inter-county, cross-county play. Um, it, it, it was um, a compromise to the spirit of it need to be part of rules and regulation and what was expected for competition and tournaments. I asked committee, um, my, my fellow committee, to, to ensure that um, those gyms are not compromised. I know you're going to, I mean, I already can anticipate you're going to have to make some decisions. Right. And I trust that you'll make the right decisions. But there's sort of like a core fundamental that says, okay, but don't compromise that right there, um, that we find ourselves with a a 45, you know, um, you know, I don't know how many feet, you know, uh, 40 by, what, 45 by 90 basketball court. I mean, hopefully we won't be in that place where we compromise um, that facility where we'd be like Mount Carmel where people didn't really want to play there because we weren't competitive. They're like, who has an 80 yard football field? Um, and so I ask that that be, um, Commissioner Mitchell, that we, 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 we hold that fast, but if you have to make some changes, which it sounds like you're going to have to if the dollars hit. Um, duly noted. Um, and I think the public, and I have no problem taking that back to the public, it's just, it, it's a, a function of trade-off. I yield, Madam Chair, that's all I needed. Okay, thank you so thank much. Thank you, guys. Uh, you got it. Thank Vice you. Vice Chairman Robinson, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Geider. Yes, uh, Mr. Gable, um, you mentioned uh, the Highway 5 intersection and that mm -hmm. Miguel would be bringing those other recommendations to us. I think I read, I don't know whether I read it in the paper or where, or in a committee meeting, that the signs at, at the um, old K Kmart shopping center mm -hmm. is in the way of the left turn, right, I mean the right, right turn, turn lane, uh, turn. And so um, is that what He's going to be bring. Is he going to bring it before us today, or a win? Uh. Um, no, no, ma'am. Um, there's some. Um, this is a real estate uh, issue, and we will be discussing it in the transportation committee um, in executive session. But there's, you know, it's it's a property acquisition. Uh, as district commissioner of that of that district, I, I would like to have a heads up uh, or have some say so as to the direction that this would be going. So uh, I represent uh, that whole side of the county plus the mall. So um, I would like to have a conversation with uh, Mr. Valentine about uh, what is being proposed. Yes, ma'am, um, yes, ma we'll make sure you get that information. <clears throat> Thank you, because uh, oftentimes the district commissioners are the last people to know things. Um, when uh, y'all were talking, uh, you and the vice chair were talking about the uh, the youth center and everything, and because the square footage is being reduced due to uh, recent uh, square footage of uh, construction, I can understand that. But uh, 
uh, you know, that park is in a very remote area, one, one side of the county is not going to serve a whole lot of uh, the other youth. Uh, I, I had proposed that it be put at uh, Deer Lake, which is a more central location, but evidently um, any Wakey Falls has a lot of clout down there. So anyway, um, that's going to affect a, a lot of our construction. Uh, such as the senior center that's going to be in Lithier Springs. Um, so uh, have you seen that in and when you're putting bids out and everything that you cannot get the square footage that you originally estimated because of the increase in the square footage construction cost? Well, it, it, as Gary mentioned, certainly <coughs> You know, when, when this was adopted and these estimates came up, but there's been obviously been a lot of inflation with that. But even so, I've we've worked with two architects now, and they and they're somewhat taken back. They're you know we're coming in higher than their estimates. So if the I think the timing right now, there's so much work out there, they're just able to bid them at a higher. You know, if they don't get it, they don't get it. Mm -hmm. But they just have a lot of work. Um, I've talked to some folks in Cobb County and. They've gotten high bids, but they've gotten also gotten some, some, some better bids. So mm -hmm. it may be that we put the next concession building out and, and it and get it comes in a little better. But so far, the the two projects we put on the street have come in two hundred dollars a square foot or higher. Um, wow. Yeah, and it's uh, it's, it's kind of it's a little bit surprising. Was that the uh, problem with uh, station number three, which is the Bell Arps fire station? Station three is one we we. It's on, it's on the agenda to prove. We, I understand we, that, but the prices came in a lot higher than y'all had anticipated. Yes, <laughs> and that was a little more difficult because it was, it was renovation type work mixed in with some new construction. So we were, it, it was a little bit harder to sharpen my pencils with that, but the boundary waters, is, that's just straight beer. You know, it's a brand new building, no demolition. Uh, still came in, uh, you know, above what we had anticipated. Well, I, I remember looking at some of the books that I get on Parks mm -hmm. and Rec, uh, and there are almost like prefab buildings out there. Oh. Uh, but we're not looking at anything like that. I no, I mean you've seen the, the rendering. This is a this will be a nice facility, um, but it, it's just that's just I think, and I'm anticipating something like that with Bill Art and Fair Play um, to come in. The Fair Play also. Yeah, to come in. Um, Hopefully not, but they're coming higher than what, mm -hmm. certainly what was budgeted in the, in the, the original SWAS number. And also um, on the fair play uh, poles, mm -hmm. the light poles and everything, do you have an idea of when that, do we have to bid, we have to bid it out, I assume? Yeah, we'll have to, we'll have to bid it out, but it's, and it's just the, it's just the lighting and the poles. This has its own budget, and I, I can probably get the plans done within two or three weeks once I get get them on board and uh, hopefully have it out for bid uh, August, September. Um, well, in, in recent not, okay. days, even weeks, we've had a lot of storms and everything, yeah. and so uh, I don't, I, I know ball season's coming up, uh, softball is uh, be, be coming around. And we just want to make sure that our kids are safe. Yeah. Uh, so we need to push that as fast as we can. And with that, I yield back. Okay, thank you so much, Commissioner Guider. And also, as we we're speaking about the fair play, I was under the impression that we were moving quickly. I thought it was quite an emergency to get those polls, like polls it's, addressed. It's, it's top priority right now. Oh, it is? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, because I think we made some efforts about two weeks ago to push that forward, yeah. the Board of Commissioners. Uh, any other discussion? Any other questions for Mr. Gable? Uh, Commissioner uh, Mitchell? Yes, my apology. I had to step out for a quick second. But my first question to you about the sidewalks, the sidewalk projects. Mm -hmm. So the ones that we had out once before, are those projects kind of let and, 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 and kind of being done? Or where are we with those? When we had those that kind of went out for bid, then we end up having to do the PE on them and a few other things that, to kind of make it right. So where are we with those sidewalks? So the, you know, we originally went out for design and didn't get any bids. Okay. And okay. then we, we tried to, to do some in-house field work. We were going to maybe try to work with some local contractors. Understood. And that got too complicated because of the professional engineering that, that was going to need to be, that was going to need to take place. So we worked through that and then, uh, uh, 
ended up putting it back out for design and uh, SEI was the was awarded that contract and so they're they're set up as three different projects mm -hmm. and uh, they're they are just getting started. They're ready to, they're biting at the bits. They're ready to get started on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and we went ahead and had the, the kickoff meeting. And, and as good as they have been with staying on schedule, I, I suspect that's going to move real quick Got uh, it. between now and, and going into the fall. We'll get the plans designed. Uh, more than likely, we could either bid them out all together or we could bid them out separately. So that, that'll it. be something that we can obviously discuss. So, so did looking at possible costs, mm -hmm. How do we come in line, offline, or, or, um, you know, the, the sidewalk is is a, it's it's a budgeted category. Yes. Um, we need those numbers from the from the designer. Not right from and he'll from get us, He should from be able to get SDI, us. Those, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pretty quickly, um, he'll be able to get us some preliminary cost uh, on what each one of those projects. And and as we move forward mm -hmm. with more sidewalks, these will be some good projects to, you know, we'll have these as. We have numbers already, mm -hmm. and we'll be able to have a better idea as we move down that list uh, with budget and scope. Got it. And, and not knowing that, so you, you don't want to anticipate, so you want to kind of wait till you get some more concrete. Yeah. Okay. And, and again, we should have that uh, September, October. We should have some numbers that we can share with you. Got it. Okay. And thank you for that. The other thing, uh, you stated earlier that um, in revenue, and I don't know if this may have been asked earlier, though, but... Um, that we're, we, we still have a shortfall, but we were up last month, mm -hmm. and the shortfall now is roughly about $20,000 overall. No, oh, just oh. The, we're just comparing the two, the first two months of the, of the second splash year. Um, okay. I don't have, I think, well, we, you know, we went right up to the end of the first year, mm -hmm. and we were giving averages, but we can, right. I can have, we can share that. Well, we can actually, uh, the next report we can, well, that's probably a good number to have overall. Yes. The shortfall, we'll put that back in it. Okay, okay, good. So we can kind of make sure, kind of what it looks like. I know that's an estimate, I'm assuming, but I don't, I don't know, but you'll share the yeah, numbers. We'll, okay. we'll, we'll put that back in. Okay. And uh, um, Molarola, Mo, Molarola updates in reference to the, uh, the system that we're, we're enlighten me again to make sure. I, I mean, I get the updates and I want to thank uh, Mr. Good for all the updates and you guys going to be giving me updates. I know we're going to do something from a quarterly perspective overall, but I want to kind of be in the midst of this throughout. Yeah. So again, can we can you give me the again the updates of, of where we are, what that looks like, and hopefully uh, the numbers looks like the savings that you guys thought it would be. Uh, it's and as far as the schedule and again, Jay will be coming in in, in August. Um, I think it would be a good idea. You know, he's he's real good at telling you exactly what he's doing, where right. he's at. Uh -huh. I think I'm gonna get him to focus more on like overall schedule, mm -hmm. where you at with schedule and, and and budget. So far, we've only gotten I think one invoice from uh, from Motorola, but it is set up on certain pay intervals. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're I mean it's they're on track. The budget's on track. They're mm -hmm. they're I meaning mean, under budget a, is on track. Yes. Okay. All we right. just had a a, a a change order for in the in the black actually. They were, they're still finding savings in, in, the, mm -hmm. in the scope of the work. Good, good. And, and it's, you know, some of that's being put back into it with, with things they've added. So uh, it's on track within, within the scope, within budget right now. Everything's looking good. Okay, okay. Uh, and the Senior Citizen Center, the Olivia <coughs> Springs Senior Citizen Center, mm -hmm. um, from what I was reading, some, I mean, what you stated at that, that uh, we are uh, ready for the kickoff. I'm assuming on the P&E side of it, or kickoff. It will be that, that'll okay. be the P&E side of it. So, okay. Uh, for the so it'll be the architect there with DC staff, just anyone that wants you know invited some other folks. Um, but it'll be at that. It's a good time to brainstorm it, give the right. architect a good idea of what we're looking for, and that's that's really what they need to. Okay, y'all tell me what you you want. And right. We start there and kind of move forward with it. So that's. And where do we plan to have this type of a community input and, and have this kind of a conversation? I mean, as far as the kickoff meeting, yes, I've got it scheduled at the Woody Fight Senior Center. Got it. Got it. And, um, and go ahead. Yes, that, the, we'll, we'll have it there. Uh, uh, and Sharon was uh, plot enough to allow it. You know, I set, set it up there. We thought it'd be a good idea, you know, being the senior center, the existing senior center. And so we'll, we'll have it there. Got it. And, and, when, and when we'll be tr making this announcement, so those that would like to kind of partake in this. Uh, in the kickoff meeting? 
Yes, yes, that's what I'm speaking of, I'm sorry. So, well, I mean, we've got, what I've typically done on, on prior kickoff meetings is, is the architect with direct, you know, directors as far as the, the departments and a couple of my staff, a smaller meeting mm -hmm. just to kind of focus on what the architect's looking for. Correct. You know, we, and we've talked about, I mean, once we get him started, as far as, you know, like with a rec center, as soon as we can have a, start having some public information meetings as many as you as many as we feel like is necessary mm -hmm. and and start getting input and david good's already gotten some good input course with correct that and the rec center so we already got a good start on it um and this is a this is a good time to you know we're just it's early stages we'll be getting a good idea of the budgets as we you know they'll be throwing some numbers at us like they did with the rec center mm -hmm. um so Looking well, the good part is that we'll have this conversation with the general public, so they'll have some input as to what that could look like. Exactly. Yeah. So, and, and that's what I just want to make sure that we're able to present or at least market that mere fact of this is that date, this is that time when you can come down and have this kind of a conversation with those. Certainly. Yeah. Certainly. We'll make sure we will, David, will work with, with communications here and make sure we get it publicized whenever we, we have that meeting. Yes. Uh, it'll, we'll make sure it's. Yeah, play, play an advance notice just like the rec center right uh so that every, everybody's aware of it and has an opportunity to attend if they and, and, and i would say share that with the entire board not just sure i know i have a a, a direct interest but with the entire board so they can kind of share that information as well but thank okay. you again sure. the, the, uh last but not least uh the 40 percent of the local vendors i'm a little confused that you mentioned that there was a i thought a 60 percent within a 30 mile radius but i think it's a 40 percent local vendor um uh so so that that one chart is based on dollars okay and so it's as you know as we as a program even, grows, it, it, we're even with the, the uncharted dollars that you haven't even spent that that may be within no, the no that's based the, on, that's the based on current dollar spent the, okay got you yeah. okay and, and as that and it, you know we're up about 10 million and it's so the the percentage of, of you know, it's going to look a little smaller if we, until we start picking up some contractors right. that are right. in Douglas County. So we're right now it's four percent of vendors that are within Douglas County. And so right. In I Douglas saw County, right. we're getting. You know, it's good. We're getting some interest from Carroll County contractors and some Cobb, mm -hmm. um, but they're here at Douglas County. It, I, in, which you know, it's just a matter of getting them informed, and 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 then of course they've got to hit the low bid too. And, and is the, this is uh, the direct or the subs? I mean, at, at what level well, of the, support are you the, getting? Uh, because, or, or you yeah. don't even know the subs. Well, and that's what I'd mentioned about the minority companies. Mm -hmm. we, it, we've got the f information on file is we can easily tell if they're a minority <coughs> uh, firm. It's just we don't have the information of their subs. They may have some, Correct. some of the subs may be minorities, which would, if you're trying to hit a, like GDOT, right. a DBE goal, uh, that you need that information, but in this case, it's about 16% of what vendors we currently have on uh, active that are that are DBE or minority. Okay, okay, okay. Well, if we can get that, those other numbers, uh, will be great. Um, sure. Outside of that, I yield back, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Lowe here. Yes, I'm going to touch on a topic that's near and dear to everyone's heart, and that, that's our, our roads. I'm going to ask Director Valentin to come up and drill down just a, a little bit. Uh, I will say I'm a little concerned about the information about uh, C.W. Matthews uh, coming into our county kind of late in what's typically the paving cycle due to weather and so forth. So, uh, Mr. Valentin, would you give us some confidence that we're going to get this paving done this year, or are you willing to step out that far? <laughs> um, absolutely. Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chair. Commissioners. Good morning. Uh, the uh, the total timeline for the contract was five months, and uh, what they've indicated is that they they're, they're still on target to complete the project within that time frame. It's just that they have other commitments uh, on other projects elsewhere, so they will not be able to start as uh, as early as we had hoped. But their indication is that they will complete uh, the project by the uh, contract deadline, which is uh, the end of the year. Okay, so I guess in terms of the time cycle, it may be that they possibly be able to bring in more resources after they finish up work uh, elsewhere, mm -hmm. uh, because I know we don't like to get into the end of the winter, the cold fall season, be trying to do paving. Absolutely. Okay, and uh, I'll just uh, I'll add uh, just a personal remark. I've gotten back from uh, 
uh, New York and Massachusetts, and people in Douglas County don't, don't know what bad roads are. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any other questions from the Board of Commissioners? Uh, Vice Chairman Robinson. Yeah, just, just a, a point of, of clarity. And, and one thing was, Commissioner Mitchell here when I was making my comments about the, um, I, I stepped out. He stepped uh, then out I'll, I'll, then my, yeah. I'll take you offline. It, it's okay. okay. Now, but I, I'll just make one quick comment about, again, this whole notion of the community center and about the approach to parks. Um, and Gary Dukes will confirm this, that, um, you know, uh, a study was done. Um, it was a needs assessment on all our parks. It's probably one of the best studies we've ever had done. And in that needs assessment, it established that Douglas County was four community centers short for our size, population, and footprint, right? Um, here's somebody who has some expertise, comes from Clayton County, understands he, he's built a lot of these things, and we were below that. And so here we are, we have a mega park that actually existed prior to Anawaki coming on board. I appreciate the comment, but that, let's not put them in that place. Uh, a mega park that the prior administration thought was important back in 2002 when they built it initially. This is important. A mega park. And if you're going to build a mega park, you need to build it out with all the functionality that was associated with it. All right? 500 acres. It's, it's beautiful. It um, doesn't matter what part of the county it's on. That's where it was built. That was the land that we owned. And so that's where it went and it serves. And just like we travel. Um, to play each other in different parks, um, different areas. Anybody who's either coached, played, oversaw their kids, visited, we, we all get that. Let's, let's not belabor that. But, but the point of the needs assessment in, in recognizing is that you had a, a park, Deer Lake, and you had a facility. It was the only facility in this entire county out of 19 parks that had an indoor gym. 19 parks, the only one with indoor gym. Right? So it was relegated. So the suggestion to like, and we, we had a good debate, meaning we, I mean, it wasn't hard. It was just sort of a conversation, but it, it came down to, but why would you tear down an existing asset that was still fully functional? Why would you do that if you're already four in a hole, right? So the, the, the logic was, well, no, boundary water doesn't have, I mean, it's got everything else, but the one thing that it probably needs is an indoor facility for that area of the county. Right? So that's sort of, you know, when we talk about logic lines, follow it all the way through. And that's what that was based on, a needs assessment, that the county was below. And so I, I, I want to be sensitive that it, it's no, it, it's just, it, we just finished the body of work that was already started. I mean, we just finished the football field that was from 2002, right? That was a prior time in, 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 in Douglas County's history. So it, it's important as we make these collective decisions and we weigh in that we, we, we do have to, we in across all everything. We have to manage the assets. We, we, I, I recognize we, 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 you know, we built a new jail versus renovating the old one, right? It was more of a public safety or whatever the case may be. We're concerned about our inmates and it had ran its useful life. But that Deer Lake was not like the old jail. And so I, I, again, it was one of those where, well, where do you put it? Well, it wound up there based on logic. It was the best economical, the best place to put an asset. And again, it was a mega park versus some isolated park, um, per se. But I, I just wanted to clarify that, because I, 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 for the record, I don't want um, the comment about Anna Wakey being the one who, who sort of drove this. No, not necessarily. You just rendered, we asked their input since it was close to them. But it, but, but it was about the Board of Commissioners having a logical conversation about where to put an asset, um, and, where, and, and that's how it came out. I yield, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Robinson. Uh, Mr. Gabe, thank you so much for your great presentation, and we look forward to the next one. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next on our agenda, we have um, How do I undo that? a presentation by uh, Gary Watson. Mr. Watson, and um, if you could come forward, forward, this is a summary of the collaborative firm rebranding okay, and public cool. outreach efforts on behalf of Rideshare and Connect Douglas. Good morning, Watson. commissioners. Good morning. Um, Good morning. The collaborative firm has been working with us for the last three months. They had three specific scopes of work. Uh, we've been very pleased with the progress that we've made on those scopes of work. Uh, the collaborative firm has been very professional in their duties. They've treated all of our citizens res with respect, regardless of, of what their position was on the things that we were trying to do. 
Uh, they pay attention to detail. They put a lot of thought in what they do. And they haven't minded telling us if they thought we were going in the wrong direction on something. They, they've given us uh, gentle guidance. Uh, I'm very pleased with them, and it's been a pleasure to work with them. And at this point, uh, I'm going to ask Danielle Crow from the collaborative firm to come forward and make the presentation. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Director Watson. Let me make some adjustments here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning. Good morning Madam Chair, Commissioners, citizens of Douglas County. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to come once before, um, come once again for you. Uh, we've had several opportunities. Uh, as Gary stated, my name is Danielle Crow. I am the Director of Communications and Community Engagement at the Collaborative Firm. Our firm was selected to uh, lead the rebranding and educational campaign for Rideshare. And so we've had several opportunities to come before you and provide updates to both this board, the Transportation Committee, and to um, Gary Watson and his team at the Multimodal Service Center. Uh, therefore, I will be very brief in my comments today. I will only provide uh, a couple of campaign highlights. Um, our goals, as was previously outlined, were to rebrand, to rebrand Rideshare as Connect Douglas, uh, to enhance the Douglas County residents' awareness of services, primarily of those existing services, and to obtain public input on the proposed fixed route service. With regard to rebranding, we had several deliverables. We created a new logo to encompass all services, as you see it before you, Connect Douglas. We also established uh, branded names for existing services, uh, Freedom to Go for the Senior Voucher Program, and Smart Van Commute for the Van Pools. We also developed taglines and collateral materials, uh, several of which we shared um, during previous occasions. Under awareness, we developed and delivered a comprehensive communications plan that was delivered in uh, May, um, and it outlines several things that um, the multimodal service team can continue to do. We also conducted education outreach. Um, we directly interacted with nearly a thousand <laughs> residents, uh, and we created countless opportunities for brand exposure. And we did this by conducting 14 community kiosks. We went to various locations in the county, from um, the Woody Fight Center to Arbor Place Mall. We also went to places like the public libraries, where we knew we would find people who were transit dependent. Uh, we also went to um, several other places, um, Commissioner Mitchell's Coffee and Conversation. We went to various places because we knew it was important to reach a broad spectrum of the citizens. What did we hear? Well, by going various places and seeing diverse people, we heard very various opinions. Um, at this time, we were merely sharing information on existing services, and we had people ask us how to get on the programs. We saw a great interest, and we saw people who were not aware of the programs. Um, I guess some of the um, anecdotal information I can share is that on several occasions while we were out sharing contact information at the community kiosk, we had people call directly from the table using the contact information, calling the multimodal services department um, to receive that information to inquire how they could participate in the programs. We also had people ask could they take more literature to their church because they knew that people in their areas needed that information. While at this time we were not sharing any information about the bus service, we did also receive information about that. We had people share that um, they asked if they were, there would be an expansion of services. They also asked when are they going to start bus services. Uh, and there were also people who expressed that they did not want this. Um, during this time, we also met people who stated that they had used many of the services under the ride share umbrella previously. People who had utilized Van Pool or knew someone who um, used the voucher program. 
During the public input phase of this campaign, we collaborated with each of the uh, Douglas County Commissioners to conduct a public input open house within their district. Um, special thanks to Ms. Sherry Mathis within your office uh, for assisting us in coordinating these events and ensuring that it aligned with your schedules and preferences. There were four district open houses and on record, there are 113 Douglas County residents who attended. These are the residents who signed the, um, the rosters, the sign-in sheet, so it is a matter of record. Uh, they participated in the five interactive activity centers, including a bus tour. Uh, there was always multimodal um, representation on staff, uh, Mr. Gary Watson, some of his other staff members, as well as uh, Justin <coughs> McDermott, who provided the tour of the cutaway vehicle. Um, there are also several of you commissioners who attended these in your districts as well. Um, beyond completing the interactive exercises that were provided, we also provided residents the opportunity to complete a comment card. We feel that it's imperative that um, the public always have an opportunity to express their input, and so that opportunity was extended as well. And 29 of them uh, completed those, and it was included in the report that you all received. Mm -hmm. The input exercises uh, require very limited reading or writing, so people at various educational um, you know, backgrounds could participate. Um, it covered information that was approved and authorized by the Department of Trans Multimodal Transportation Services. So we gathered input on proposed routes. We allowed uh, respondents the opportunity to suggest additional stops. We also received input on schedules, fares, and vehicle quality. What we heard. Um, we heard uh, people who saw that they wanted to see more routes offered, including uh, a downtown to 92 South service. Um, there were those who shared that they didn't plan on using the bus much beyond maybe to go into downtown to see concerts and shows. And there were others who thought that the service was a much needed one in Douglas County from an economic standpoint. We also heard citizens who said that let the citizens vote if they want the bus system or not. We also heard from people who said that they don't want buses. We also heard from people who said stop calling it a bus, it's a van. Um, our job and our role was to document what was said, not to um, drive it in any direction, but to present what the people said and to provide them the opportunity to, to say what they wanted to share. So uh, we heard from various people in these different things. Among the, um, we, after all of the sessions were completed, we delivered a detailed summary of uh, the public input along with our final summary of the campaign. Some of the highlights that I can share from the uh, information once we aggregated it was that we saw that there was a preference to pay per ride relative to fares. We also saw that when people were allowed the opportunity to review fares comparative to other areas, that $2 one way was considered a reasonable fare by the majority of the people. Um, of uh, important note was that the vehicle ranked exceptional in all aspects of accessibility, comfort, attractiveness, and safety. Uh, there were some respondents who took the opportunity to stress the need to coordinate transfer structure with other services like Cobb, Link, and MARTA. And although provided an opportunity, um, no one exercised um, to provide additional stop suggestions. Um, and then lastly, because I know that you all have been provided the, the very full report of more than 100 pages of all aspects of this campaign. We just want to say again, thank you for allowing us the opportunity to serve Douglas County. Uh, we want to thank you and we want to thank the citizens. Um, we pledged when we sought to serve in this capacity that we would provide a process that was thorough and inclusive, irrespective of the public's opinions or their passions. I know that I personally remain committed to doing that. And I want to thank uh, the people who took the opportunity to express their views, because I firmly believe that good public participation 
um, is inclusive and it's respectful and uh, of everyone's opinion and it presents that information in an unfiltered fashion and that's what we've done. Thank you. Thank you as well, uh, Mrs. Crow. Uh, any questions from the Board of Commissioners or comments? Yes. Mrs. Crow, Commissioner Guider. Yes, uh, did y'all ever have the kiosk out at uh, Mirror Lake that I was promised? <laughs> Uh, we conducted all of the kiosks that were approved during the, the portion of the campaign that was outlined. Well, so, at, at our one of our meetings, and I can't remember, <clears throat> I asked that Mirror Lake, which is a huge community, that they be included in this. Uh, so, and your boss, when he walked by as he was leaving the room, says, we'll have one at Mirror Lake. So I'm just asking, did you have one at Mirror Lake? Um, I, perhaps you're referring to my supervisor. Um, well, okay. <laughs> and he, I, I'm, to my knowledge, there was not a community kiosk conducted at Mirror Lake. I think when you all spoke, we were in the phases of conducting the public input sessions. Are you talking about a community room when you say that? A public? So, we, we differentiated um, the education outreach, and that's where we did the community kiosk. There were several held throughout the county. There were 14. With regard to the public input mm -hmm. sessions, there were four held, one in each district. Well, what I'm asking, because I have a city. Mm -hmm. I have city residents of thousands. Uh, I think there's about 7,000 out there. Did y'all hold one out? In Mirror Lake, there were no events. Mirror, Mirror Lake. There were no events held in Mirror Lake. Okay, I was told you would have one. So, uh, I don't think this. Well, 113 residents out of what the four meetings that you had. Mm -hmm. Do you call that a successful turnout? Should you I speak? can respond. Yeah. Um, compared to um, several other studies, when we compare that, yes, uh, we conduct these sessions, and actually, Commissioner Geider, the majority of the residents who attended these were from District Four. We allowed people the opportunity to indicate which district they were coming from. District Four had the largest representation, irrespective of location, so they did not only attend the session at Dog River, which was hosted in your um, district, but they also attended other sessions. The second highest group that was represented were people who did not know their district. So yes, compared to other studies that we have worked on relative to transportation and those that are in your peer county, in your peer group, yes, this representation was normal. Well. Um so I when think you leave Athens out Clark, seven thousand oh. people in a district, um, I think their voice needs to be heard. Now, did you conduct any online surveys? The client <clears throat> opted not to conduct an online survey. The client being us. The sur uh, online survey was not conducted for public input. You're speaking specifically. Yes. Yes. So that people that could not go to the meeting, I understand. That they could voice their. I understand. It doesn't seem like we were very represented. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I yield back. Okay. Any other comments from the Board of Commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Mulcair. Thank you for the report. Uh, <coughs> your verbal presentation. Uh, you referenced a couple of times to a 100-page report. Has that been given to the commissioners, or has it been emailed, or? To my, I'm, I'm not certain. To my knowledge, our directives were to forward the information to our primary point of contact, and then the Department of Multimodal Transportation uh, Services. I see Gary creeping up. <laughs> <laughs> if I can answer that quickly, no, sir. I haven't submitted that to the commissioners okay. yet. That's on me. My plate's been so full, it just it slipped my mind. But I do have have it, and I can get that to you this afternoon. Okay. We need okay. it as soon as possible. Yes, sir. I can get that. And to you. Uh, and then back to our presenter. Um, I was looking at uh, the second to the last page, having to do with Route 10 downtown Douglasville. 
And it looks like a great preponderance of people were uh, found that to be the lowest priority, uh, regardless of uh, uh, location, uh, the stop. And uh, what do you uh, attribute that to? Um, respectfully, Commissioner Malk here, my role is to conduct public input. We were not allowed to extrapolate any findings okay. uh, or make any assumptions on what the people's well, I appreciate. I, I, I appreciate what you're saying. I, yeah, I, I understand. Um, I yield we, back. We presented, and I regret that you do not have that in hand, but the report details all the information in aggregate for each route. That's probably what we need to look at. Okay. I yield back. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Robinson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I want to, a, a couple of things. One, I want to acknowledge the collaborative um, firm's effort. I mean, this was, um, a project, though Gary said, three, over the past three months, it really was two months of a scope of work that they had to get in here, ramp up, and get out here and get, um, you know, the three elements associated with this. It was a yeoman's effort. This, this, just the average firm that, you know, believes that their consultants couldn't pull this off. This, this wasn't a play-play exercise, and I want to commend you guys. And, Unfortunately, you guys, I, I got a copy of the, of the study, and I had a chance to take a look at it, and Gary, everybody should have had this by now, so I, 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 but I can't cut my comments because I did see it, and it was a very well done document. Um, and Commissioner Mulcair, there's, there's some rich information in there, but they were bound in that they were not supposed to give any interpretation. Uh, it was just supposed to be about facts, right? That's all we need to do was to educate and get input. Um, and so for that, you guys did a great job, from my opinion. I appreciate the work that you did. They even, I mean, it's, it's one thing doing that, but also they laid out a communication plan. Um, it, it's pretty evident, and I'll give interpretation, that we didn't do a very good job of communicating any of our services, which we already know that's what that FTA grant was about, was to educate people on our existing services. I mean, we just, we didn't. That, that was the culture of Douglas County. It, 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 the government was pretty quiet. It didn't engage the public. That's probably where we are right now. It, it, it's, it's a derivative of just that atmosphere. It was very closed, right? It, and people didn't know. And if you, when you look at this report, it's like, well, it confirmed what we sort of intuitively know and what staff might have said we knew, but it's pretty obvious, right? And though those people who knew, they knew, but then there's a lot of people like, well, I just didn't know. It's funny, we were at a meeting, and I, I think the county administrator was there, um, Friday when we met with Cobb, and they said their, their, their Cobb link system been there for 30 years, and they just went through a similar exercise, and they said a lot of people there don't even know that it existed, you know, recognizing. So I, I wanted to, you know, acknowledge the work that was done on that. I mean, the, the study was first rate, and you, you um, I have to commend um, Madam um, Crow here to have to, you know, be in those atmospheres. I mean, the one that was at Commissioner Mitchell's coffee and conversation, it's, you know, we, we, it was important that they didn't get pulled into the narrative and, and be swung away one or another because the public is very savvy at what they do and they, they, they try to use consultants to, to validate their points and stuff. But I appreciate your capacity to be able to stay on point, give us the facts, and let the staff and um, us as the Board of Commissioners sort of derive our own conclusions. So well done. Thank you. Madam Chair, I yield. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Robinson. Uh, Commissioner Mitchell? Yes, just, just. Uh, we're not going to elongate this, but job, I, I think you did a, a great job at, at educating uh, the public and not trying to size up the public as to what that looked like. But I, I'd like to ask Gary if he'll step up to the podium just for, for one quick question and, and then we'll move on. And I know you got, from what you just stated earlier, you got a little busy and didn't get a chance to forward the report. Um, not a good look, because I think it's only fair that, and I don't know if the report was ready to be shared, I'm not sure, but I, I think this board should have at least had at least uh, read the document, uh, reviewed it, just for practical purposes. So, um, not a good look to not have the documents before now, or at least the committee 
should have at least had the documents. And I don't know exactly when you got it and how busy you got that that got you sidetracked, but here nor there. So when are we going to get that document? So at least, or is that document ready to be shared with the general public? It's ready. I'll get it to you this afternoon. Got it. Okay. So, so let's, Mark, I don't know if we can make sure that not only the Board of Commissioners get that, and it's okay to be shared with the general public. I don't know, if, is that a legal question or not? Is that, can, as long as they, I mean, it, it should. I don't know anything that would be exempt, and if okay. it's a report, okay. it's a document, be subject to open record. Well, right, okay, because I just think that at least the general public, whether you for it or against it, I, that's not my concern right now. My concern is to make sure that those who want to read it, read it. For those who don't, I mean, shred it, take it and throw it away. So can we definitely get that? Absolutely. Okay. And, and with that being said, it, it gets kind of tough um, knowing tomorrow this thing going to either move forward or not w with the lack of not knowing what that document looks like and what it entails. So, uh, Madam Chair, I don't know kind of how you want to move forward with that, though, but again, as soon as possible, in a few minutes if you can, um, that needs to be expressed and sent and made public for those who would like to read it. Sure. I yield back. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Mitchell. Uh, Director Watson, I believe we could, you mentioned you will have that document to the Board of Commissioners by this evening, and also if our Communications Director I don't see him in. Oh, okay, there he is. If he could just uh, work with Mr. Watson and see if we could uh, get it online uh, visible for the uh, citizens of Douglas County, please. I think that'll be easy. And okay, and it's 100 pages. Is it 100 pages? Is it an easy read? Yeah, the full report. Yeah, okay. All the right. The the full report is maybe 39 pages okay. it's not very long but the appendix is considerably okay. long okay just wanted to make sure it was something that we was, uh, yeah. that we could uh, do by tomorrow something that could be handled by tomorrow 39 pages okay thank you so much uh any other questions for um mrs crow all right thank you so much and we appreciate what the collaborative firm have done here in douglas county to educate our, our citizens and also the commission as well regarding this uh um, our transportation um, modes here in Douglas County. Um, next, we have approval of the minutes. Uh, commissioners, just take a look at these minutes and uh, we will approve tomorrow. Uh, County Administrator, do we have any new business or any type of business you would like to discuss at this time? Uh, no, ma'am. No, I'm uh, sure. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Robinson? Yep, just, just point, point, point of clarity. Um, I want to go back to the, the meeting minutes. And during our last meeting, um, there was a, um, an amendment to an item. And I wanted to bring clarity to what I thought was a technical error in what happened. Um, it was dealing with the LCI grant that um, Director Ron Roberts brought forth. And it was within, when inside the consent agenda, and when we talk about rules. Um, and while it was suggested that any commissioner can make an amendment to something, you already had something on the table, right? So you had a motion and a second already on the table because it was part of a consent agenda. Our rule historically for the past at least 10 years for me is that if you want to move on something, you take it outside of consent agenda, right? We know this. It was acknowledged um, by, by, in this case, Madam Guider, that well, Commissioner Robinson would be willing to, to amend it, which I had no problem with it, uh, but it moved quickly to, I make a motion to do a second, but it's like, okay, if, if that was true, then everybody could sit here and amend all day long. And that's not true. It needed, you had to act on that which was, let's pick this up and allow that amendment to move forward. But then the second error was we were inside consent agenda. We've never, ever um, acted on anything inside consent agenda. Yes, we clarify a statement that was made, but never modified it materially. It was cosmetic to me. It was more of a technical. It's like, okay, I don't, I'm not going to argue this now. I just sort of let it go because I knew what I intended to occur still occurred at the end of the day. So I was okay with what the Board of Commissioners wanted to do by way of, um, I believe the clarity was, um, the amendment was to allow it to come out to staff's um, budget um, as opposed to using SPLOS or using general fund. Um, the point was for it to move forward, which I, I, how we funded it, it was the, the full wishes of the Board, had no problem with it. But let's be careful, guys, that, it, it, and it was right, Madam Guider was right, that could, could the Vice Chair pick that up? 
or be willing to sort of pick that up, and I had no problem. But to, to just, we cut back and forth, cut back, that, that's not how Robert's rules work. Um, that wasn't intended as the council came forth. The action, the, the comment was accurate. Anybody can make an amendment. You can. But you had something already on the table, and it was inside the consent agenda. So it was a duel to me. So I just wanted to clarify that, because I got asked a couple of times by people what happened on that. Um, and so I had to, um, for the record. So Madam Chair, I yield. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, again, I will ask the Board of Commissioners to please take a look at tomorrow's minute, uh, minutes and then we'll go forward, forward with uh, approval. Um, next, we have resolutions. We have two resolutions. Uh, tab number four, resolution authorizing the closing of the sale of the old jail to the city of Douglasville. Um, General Counsel. I'm sorry, I'm still thinking about the last thing. I'm, uh, I apologize. Yeah, we don't tap uh, This is the, uh, uh, in April, uh, y'all entered into an option agreement with the city for the purchase of the old jail site. Uh, the city is uh, exercising its option in order to close. We've got to authorize the county to go forward on the closing of that. Y'all remember it's $850,000. Uh, mm -hmm. They did accept uh, the provision that we put in about the sky bridge. They will own, control, and maintain the sky bridge, but if and when they ever take it down, we get a right to have it for free for county's use it for whatever y'all might use it for. And they do not have access to the Gamble bil uh, building. I think there's an ability at the Gamble building for us to secure that, but if we do any other security to block the sky bridge from accessing, that would be at our own cost. But this, this transaction will close because the option ends on August 1st, and the closing will be probably this week, Madam Chairman. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the board? Uh, Commissioner Guider. Yes, uh, and I guess I'll direct this to Ken. Um, what about as is? <laughs> they, they are buying it as is, where it is, with all faults. There's no condition or representation made as to the environmental status of that building or anything related to it. What's not being passed is any. If, for instance, you had a claim that originated prior to our transaction, we're not washing our hands of that, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, they're buying it as is, where is. Uh, have we had claims today? I would rather not discuss those in open form. That's an executive session item if you need to discuss it. Okay. I will tell you, that, I will tell you just so, since you asked, because I I, I'm scared by me saying that, that implies we got all kinds of claims over there. The only thing I've ever heard that I can remember, and I wouldn't want to be held to this, is one movie production company's producer claimed an employee or two employees filed a workers' comp claim, and their carrier contacted me at one time. When we tried to contact them back, we never could get anybody. But you're not passing the buck by virtue of this transaction to any claim that would have originated during your watch. But I can't. <laughs> I can't speak into the to the environmental conditions of that facility that's that old, and I don't know the history, so I'd rather leave it at that. So, um, in the environmental problems that could or could not exist, are we covered uh, that we are not going to be held liable if they find asbestos or something like that? Yes. There's two separate issues, and I'm gonna make sure we're clear about this. The first one is they're buying the building as is, where is, with whatever conditions it exists. We're not responsible for that as a county. The second condition I mentioned was they're not assuming responsibility for some claim that originates as a result of use during our ownership. Okay. Right now, I don't know of any other than the producer contacting us and we can't get, I mean the insurance company contacting us for, for a production company. I would say there is no claim spending against the county related to that. The claim was a workers comp claim filed against the movie production company. I don't know the details of it because we can never get in touch with the claims representative who initially made contact with us. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, and also I think there's a stream or underwater stream, underground stream. Uh, somewhere on that property, would we be liable uh, with any requirements from EPD? Pretty soon the deal's gonna get blown up, but aside from, <coughs> as is, where is means any subsurface right. okay. condition on or under the premise or in the air, 
they're assuming, and that's reflected in the purchase price of this transaction. And will they be hauling all the debris away? I don't know what they're going to do with it. <laughs> but, I mean, we won't be responsible no. for hauling the debris away, no. I guess. No, ma'am. No. All right. I yield back. Okay. Any other questions, Commissioner Mulk here? Yeah, just uh, a brief point of clarity. Which I'm Michael? curious Michael. about the issue. <laughs> this is Mike on the mic. Okay. Uh, just a point of clarity on the uh, on the bridge. What I had asked that we have the right of first refusal, uh, if they decide to remove the bridge, not need it, not want it, not want to maintain it, whatever. Uh, the potential is uh, my thoughts were that possibly we could use that to bridge uh, some park property, for example, a Dog River, where we have two parcels, mm -hmm. and the Dog River uh, running through it. Uh, the potential for using that bridge in one of our parks. So I yield back. Okay. Okay. Commissioner Mitchell. Okay, Ken, just, just for clarity, and I don't know, you may not have this in front of you, but help me to understand, wasn't all these things identified in the contract with the city yes. when, when we made this, this offer and they accept, correct? Just That's correct. So, the only thing I, that was added after they initially approached us was Commissioner Mulcair's request about the sky bridge, they agreed and to put that in. Exactly. And we get it of no charge, right, right of first refusal, if they end up removing it. But I don't think their intent is to remove it. And if there's some act of God and that thing fall apart, they're responsible for even closing our end, from my understanding, when we put this all together, correct? The only thing they're not responsible for is the gamble building, once it touches the gamble building. If right. their tear away, tears up the gamble building, they are responsible for repairing the gamble Closing building. Closing it off. Right. But they have full response for maintenance, repair, and whatever they're right. going to do with right. the structure. Right. Okay. The bridge structure, I'm right. sorry. That's, that's what I thought. And to add to Commissioner's mole care uh, request, which was added in the event that I always said that's a long stretch, but it was added just to reassure that that was doable. Um, we were okay with that, being the first, the right, uh, the first right of refusal, correct? I'm sorry. The, the about the what? bridge. About the, the yeah. They, yes. they, they, it's been signed. The, the agreement that was signed, the option agreement, includes specific language about the sky, the sky bridge. Okay. I'll call it. And I just want to make sure because I know that was done uh, at least prior to uh, all the negotiations between myself and, and the city and everybody else to come to this resolve of what that would look like in selling or making that offer uh, for that piece of property. I think that's correct. Thank you very much. I yield. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, I'll move on Madam to Chair. Okay, Commissioner Robinson. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Yeah, real quick, and I, I again, this is, I, I just want to acknowledge um, to, to Commissioner Mitchells and, and Commissioner Mulcair, those who are actively involved in this. This is one of those um, transactions I probably had the least involvement because I've always took the position that the Douglas County should not be in downtown Douglasville. I've always promoted the sale of that jail. Um, just, I mean, as far as all the master planning and redevelopment, I just thought that it's city proper and let them, let them drive their own destiny. Uh, we should not be the 800 pound whatever sitting in there with that key asset that was in the middle of their future. And so I'm encouraged to see that um, going along with the will of my peers to sell it. Um, I, I think it's uh, uh, the, the amount that was arrived at and the conditions were very amenable and it's the way the process should work. So, uh, you know, kudos to my, my team members for making that work. And um, we welcome um, the cash. Um, like other things that we'll be considering during our retreat, other county owned property that we have assets that are illiquid sitting around. It's like, okay, why do we have this? I know it's the, the, the accumulation over 30 years since I've been an adult, not, you know, I, I, you know, 1990 I moved here as an adult, you know, as a, you know, coming out of college. And so I've watched this and this, and you look at the list of things that we've acquired over time, but the question is, there might have been a purpose then, but is it proper to take forward now? And so, um, again, this is the beginning of uh, an assessment of county-owned properties, and should we should not keep it for whatever reason. So, Madam Chair, um, Chair well done on this one. So, I, I yield. Okay. Thank you so much. We'll move on to tab number five, resolution to award the lease purchase agreement to the financing of certain energy savings equipment and amend the budget and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final legal review. We have anyone here from Terminus this morning? Terminus uh, Municipal Advisors. 
Uh, Madam Chair, okay. Terminus is not here. They will be here tomorrow. Okay. Uh, I believe you had a comment, uh, Attorney Bernard, regarding yeah, I, I can just summarize this real quick, uh, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. uh, as you all aware, you entered into an energy sa uh, savings uh, agreement with uh, Amoresco. As part of that transaction, Amoresco was going to finance part of that transaction. You all wanted to go outside of that and get, do the pri uh, get, see the, what the market would reveal. There's been uh, outside uh, uh, proposals submitted, and I think those will be brought forward at, tomorrow, I guess, Michelle. I'm not sure when, when Amoresco, excuse me, when Terminus gets here. And this resolution simply allows uh, y'all to proceed with the financing part of that. The only thing that I would say that uh, is a potential, uh, that's not an issue, but we wanted y'all to be aware of, is we think section four covers in the resolution everything that might be necessary. Mm -hmm. One uh, provision in the actual underlying funding documents that you'll receive if it's bank, whether it's a bank or otherwise, is the potential to request a surety bond or co what's called a co-obliged co rider. Uh, David wanted me, David Corbin from Terminus, I've been in communication, that's why I've been stepping out with him. There's a, it's not clear that that's required in this transaction for this funding. If it is required because the transaction is so uh, nominal, I think it's two million and some change by comparison to other transactions, that the cost of the surety bond or co obliged rider, David uh, has told me and given assurances I can pass on to Michelle Green, who's here, uh, that he is in, he's in. He has space within his proposed budget that he's given finance that would cover that obligation. The legal department and outside counsel are working with the other folks because we're not sure it's actually required. But if it is required, we wanted you all to know that David has told us that it would be consumed within the cost he's proposed to Michelle, although it's not an itemized item yet because it just came up this morning as we were in this meeting. Okay. Thank you. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Comment. Okay, we'll move on to tab. Then next we have our business items. We'll move to tab number six, authorization to approve a lease agreement with Cornerstone Baptist Church for the lease of a house to be used for housing <coughs> homeless uh, participants in the felony drug court program as part of Sanctuary Village and authorize the chairman to sign all documents subject to final legal review. Judge Bo McLean. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. I'm going to try to, in the interest of time and to honor my guest, Pastor Ben Lang's schedule, uh, he had to step out to address an immediate <coughs> phone issue. Uh, I'm going to take something that would take about seven minutes and maybe truncate it into one minute. Um, as you know, we started our drug court in 2015 with five participants immediately started having issues with homeless participants. So we started looking for resources. We don't have the ability or the capacity, the staff, the money to supervise people in our program that are living under trees and in tents. Mm -hmm. So uh, working through that issue, the board's been very helpful, helped us establish uh, Sanctuary Village, the farmhouse at the old GSO property on uh, the county uh, landfill area. We've been operating that successfully for over a year with no issues, mm -hmm. no concerns, no problems. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, uh, some of the systems we've set up there have been helping the landfill folks with a theft problem they have. Um, it, at any rate, it continues to not be enough. Uh, and to illustrate that, when we started the court in 2015, we started it with five participants. Last week, our census was 97 participants including those in the mental health court that we established. So the growth has been exponential. When I came before the board a while back and said, if you guys want me to grow this court, I need some help. You gave it to me and we've grown the court uh, phenomenally and successfully. Uh, we need more housing. Uh, Pastor Ben Lang and the, the leadership and congregation of Cornerstone Baptist Church has a home uh, behind the church that they have agreed to let us have at no cost uh, to house female participants of our program. Our intent is to move female participants from the GSO house, the farmhouse, 
to this house and, and sort of shift the house at the landfill area to male participants to fit with the male participants we intend to house at the village project at the old animal uh, shelter area. We, we just don't think it's a good idea to have male and female participants in too close a proximity because there's just mischief that can occur when you do that. And so uh, through my relationship and friendship with Pastor Lang, uh, he's come, he's viewed our staffing, he's viewed our court, uh, this house became available. Uh, for me and him, a handshake would do, uh, but the, uh, the county attorney said that a lease would be best <coughs> and that we needed to submit that lease to you for approval, <coughs> for signature by the board chair. Uh, there is no cost to the county. Uh, Cornerstone is agreeing to uh, let us use the house at no cost. Uh, we will be responsible for just general upkeep and utilities uh, for the residents that are there and keeping it clean and just normal wear and tear. Uh, major systems, major issues they would be responsible for because they will continue to own the house. And either side can opt out with 30 days uh, notice. Uh, that's the gist of it. We're ready to go if you are. I'd like to bring Pastor uh, to the, the podium, if you wouldn't mind, and just let him share with you just for a moment. Madam Chair and the board, good, good afternoon uh, to yeah. you now. Uh, we're so happy to be a part of a what God is doing in our community. Uh, we want to be Christ in the community, just like many of our churches in Douglas County, which is a great place to live. I've been here now for about 25 years in Atlanta for about 34 years, but love living in Douglas County and anything that Cornerstone can do to make our county a better place, uh, we're willing to do that, and particularly with uh, people like Judge McLean. And so we look forward to uh, the great uh, things that will be going on there at that house but also to see lives changed. Uh, if you change your life, you change the community. So we're glad to be a part of this and I hope that you would approve of what he has stated here today. Thank you. Are, are there any questions? I'll just add that uh, I was going to update you on what's going on at the landfill, but in the interest of time and, and the needs of everyone else, I think I'll save that for another time if that's okay with the board. The only thing I will say about that is that Mr. Mark Teal has been very, very helpful to me with that process, and I'm very thankful to everything he's done to facilitate things. And I just want to publicly thank you, Mr. Teal. Any questions? Any, any questions for Judge McLean? Um, Commissioner Guider? Yes. Judge McLean, uh, you say there's going to be no cost to the county. What about insurance? Well, uh, I think the, the, they're going to maintain the insurance that they would have to take care of their building. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that uh, the county attorney would agree with me that once we lease the building, uh, like any property that the county has an interest in, uh, there is an issue where the county would have to cover liability, just like it has to cover liability for this building or the old courthouse or the farmhouse or any other structure once a lease is signed. So uh, that just comes with the territory. But this is for females because yes, yes, there is a school right across the street. Uh, yes, ma'am, so. it is for females. And that was actually a subject of discussion between myself and pastor and the leadership of the church. And they expressed a preference uh, because of, of your concerns and we said absolutely that will fit with our plans with regard to what we're doing at the landfill. Do you know how many uh, females will be located there? Three to four maximum. Again, we are limited in what we can do because of the fire safety codes. And there's no way of uh, getting around that because uh, <laughs> we could expand so the one out at the landfill. if. It <laughs> well, I think there is, but I have agreed to cooperate and work with folks and get along with folks rather than fight that battle right now. Okay, and do you, how long will someone stay there? Uh, is it like six months? It really varies according <coughs> to the participant and their progress in the program. A lot of our participants move through quickly and become self-sustaining. Others, it takes longer. 
Uh, but once someone has been there for approaching six months, we start ratcheting up the pressure on them to kind of make their own arrangements and not let them get too comfortable and not do what they need to do. When you initially enter our program, the requirements are very, very heavy and very time consuming. There's curfews, there's surveillance, there's a lot of treatment, a lot of classes. So we don't pressure our folks to come up with money or jobs or things of that nature in the early phases because they really need to focus on their recovery. Uh, what about transportation for these participants? We will be providing it. We, as you know, we have uh, access to a ride share van and uh, we have a, someone to drive it. And so if a participant needs to be transported, we transport them. All right, I yield back. Okay. Any other questions for the board or comments? Or Commissioner Robinson? Yeah, I'll, I'll be very brief. I, again, I just want to uh, commend you, Judge McLean, for your, your effort with this. Um, this is, you know, like you said, a three year process. Uh, when I first got exposed to this, um, meaning um, the accountability course down at ACCG in Savannah in 2015. Uh, we're at the beginning of the, um, obviously, the General Assembly's um, order. You know, we call it the unfunded mandate, but it was the right mandate. And to see what you've done here, and uh, it's been a learning process, and um, everything is not perfect. It was, you know, we had disagreements on the difference between who would promote education and awareness, and I, I learned very quickly appropriation, how it should be split, that the courts are only responsible for intervention. It's court ordered, and the rest is in general government. And so there was a place there where we were able to find agreement um, and to move this program forward. It wasn't a zero-sum game. Um, and I appreciate your, your, your willingness to, to help me understand what was necessary. So, um, Judge, I, pre I just want to acknowledge that, that um, I've, I've come to appreciate um, your business model and your approach and your partnerships in the community um, to make um, um, a quality of life better here in Douglas County. Um, even for those who need a second chance, those who should be given a consideration um, on the front side. So thank you, sir. I appreciate it. I yield back, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Judge McClain, for everything that you're doing. Thank Madam you. Chair, thank you. And I will tell you that uh, we had to establish a protocol a few months right. ago because we lacked housing resources. We had to notify the public defender and defense counsel that mm -hmm. someone coming into the court, and there was no place for them to go. Their option is to simply go ahead and go to prison and do their mm -hmm. time or wait on a, an option to become available. And that's a protocol we unfortunately have to have now right. because 20% of our people are homeless. Right. So we're working as fast as we can and we're so thankful for the board for its support. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay, moving on to tab number seven, authorization to approve the SFY 2019 aging services contract with the Atlanta Regional Commission and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Hagan, how are you? I'm how doing are well. You? Thank you, Madam Chair. Fine. Commissioner, good afternoon. Um, this is the annual contract with ARC for the provision of aging services in the county. And this contract provides federal and state funds that assist in the provision of the Home Liver Mills Program, the Congregate Mills Program, case management, and homemaker services. Um, the 2019 contract is for a total of $458,847.86. Um, it's a slight decrease of $7,289 from the final 2018 contract total. Um, contract adjustments are typically made in the fall, and we would expect a a small adjustment to that sometime in the next two to three months. Okay, any questions from the board? Thank you so much, uh, you. Director Hagan. Just wanted to thank you for what you're doing and how you're working with, uh, with our seniors and for our seniors. And uh, as you are aware, I serve on the Senior, senior and Agent and Independence, Independence Board for ARC and definitely at the table at every turn, making sure that our seniors uh, get just what they deserve and more. And thank you for standing in the wings. And I, if you could just repeat the amount of dollars that that I'm sure it's really um, the 2019 contract is for, for 458,847. Now that's the it's not the total value of the contract. That's the amount of state and federal funds. The actual total would include some local match, but that's the amount of the fund funding available to us to draw down. 
Okay. Mr. Chairman, may I ask a question yes. before we dismiss him? A absolutely. Uh, Commissioner Guido has okay. a question for you. Uh, Richard, does this, is this the funding for the Meals on Wheels? Uh, that would be a portion of it, correct. A yeah. portion of it. Has that increased or decreased in the past year? Um, as far yeah. as the federal yeah. funds? I've got a total. Um, I can tell you. Let's see. Somewhere in here, I have that. <laughs> okay, home delivered had a slight decrease from two hundred and twenty thousand five twenty eight so. to two eighteen five oh six. Yeah. But now one thing that, that you need to know is that there's always a slight variation during the course of a year, just as I was mentioning, we expect a budget adjustment sometime in the next two to three months. So there is a slight decrease in that. But then conversely, the congregate mills um, funding increased from 109,000 to 136. Mm -hmm. But uh, did it go down last year, didn't the mill? Yes, ma'am. They, it, it, I don't have that number. I mean, it, I don't know from, the 17 contract to the 18 contract if it did, but they are always moving that money around because of the federal and the state intrastate funding formula. So we typically see some variation on that from year to year. And it was adjusted last year up, I, I assume? I, again, I, I don't have the 17 number with me. Could you just get that for me? Sure. I'd, I'd like to know. All sure. right. Be glad to. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Actually, um, <coughs> Director Hagan, we were expecting a sh shortfall, and you were really be coming to approach the board for some additional dollars. But we were so glad that, um, first of all, the state worked with us to make sure we were able to offset that deficit that we were expecting. And you shared that good news with us last year. Right, so thank ex you. exactly. Because initially mm -hmm. we were looking at an eighty thousand um, dollar decrease, but through your advocacy and, and the work of that committee. Um, we were able to, I think it was like 66,000 that we got back on that. Right. That right. increase. Yeah. So thank you so much okay. for what you're doing. Sure. And appreciate what our seniors are doing here in Douglas County. Sure. Well, thank you very okay. much for, for your support and support of the board. Okay. Thank you. Tab number eight. Let's move to tab number eight. Authorization to accept funds from the Bureau of Justice Assistance Office in the amount of $16,000. $187 to be used to assist children and youth involved in the Douglas Link program to provide support services and extracurricular activities for children and youth that have several mental health issues. There is no match required. Uh, Mrs. McDade, how are you this morning? Good morning. Um, this is um, a grant that we should have received earlier in the year, but there was some type of um, lawsuit that had been filed, so it was held up um, this year but they have released the 2017 grant funds um, in the amount of $16,187. Um, and as you noted, um, these funds are used to help children that have severe mental health issues. Um, we have a staffing committee that meets with the parents and the children um, to determine what um, services they need and how to access those services and then we monitor those mm -hmm. cases to make sure that they're getting all of the things that they need to improve. Okay. Any questions from the board? And there's no match. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Jenny. Pretty self explanatory. Thank yes. you. Great job. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, tab number nine, authorization to approve an intergovernmental agreement between Douglas County, the city of Douglasville, and Cobb County for the 800 megahertz digital radio system and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents subject to final legal review. Uh, Deputy Chief Sackermeyer and uh, direct, uh, Director Milholland is here to speak on that this morning. Good morning or afternoon. Um, this is the agreement we've had. Uh, and this uh, new radio system, we have multiple agreements with multiple jurisdictions because it's a region-wide system that we're, we're joining. This particular agreement is the one between the Cobb County, City of Douglasville, and ourselves. How are you going to share, to save money and use Cobb County's core instead of buying a core which is close to a million dollars? We're going to join in with them. With them, This is what, what was planned, but we had to get the paperwork and the agreement and cost Douglasville was already on there and had a different agreement. Mm -hmm. Douglasville had to be 
included in it. So it's kind of a tri agreement between the, the multiple jurisdictions on how that works and our, our expectations between the parties. Okay. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners on that particular piece? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. You have a comment, Deputy good. Chief? No, no ma'am. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Pretty self explanatory. We'll move on to um, tab number 10. Um, authorization to amend current agreement with Image Trend for integration with Target Solutions Learning Portal for continuing education portal for the fire department at a cost of $3,000 to be funded with SPLOS funds reimbursed from the City of Douglasville and authorize the Chairman to sign all related documents pending final legal review. Uh, Deputy uh, Chief. Uh, Madam Chair, Chief Commissioners, Meyer. this is the second part of the uh, process that we were talking about last week. Mm -hmm. um, this makes the software that you guys voted on last meeting where it will interact with the state and report all of our training to the state and the state does their reporting through image trend. So it's, it's to hook our new stuff up to image trend and then it can be reported to the state automatically. Okay. Any questions from the board? Sounds good. Thank you. We look forward to this new system coming on board. Thank you all. Okay. Uh, tab number 11, <laughs> authorization to confirm and approve <coughs> a, uh, award by the Atlanta Region Commission of Infrastructure and Capital Investments application for a fixed route public bus service, authorization to file a grant application with the Federal Transit Administration for federal congestion mitigation and air quality funds in the amount of $4.8 million and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. This grant will require a Douglas County match of $1.2 million and will be used to fund proposed fixed route bus service, or should I say van service, for three years. Uh, Director Watson. All right, here we go. Uh, <laughs> as the uh, <coughs> agenda item says, we are asking for authorization to move forward uh, with a grant application to the Federal Transit Administration for funds to help fund our proposed fixed route bus service for three years. Uh, this grant application will include three routes, not, not three, I'm sorry, four routes that we will uh, look at in a few minutes. But first I want to start off with sort of a, some background on how we got here to begin with. TJ is coming out to assist you. Sorry, it's not a live meeting. Yes. It's a work session. Yeah, it's a work session. We just want to be one of these calls to be. Yeah. Okay. Why did you get in to go forward on it? What did you get in? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's start off. What is CMAC? CMAC stands for Congestion Mitigation, Mitigation and Air Quality. It's a federal grant program. Funds may be used for any transit capital expenditure as long as it has an air quality benefit. And eligible projects for CMAC include transit startups or expansion of transit. And in the metro Atlanta area, CMAC projects are vetted by the Atlanta Regional Commission. Our particular project uh, was approved and moved forward by the ARC's uh, Transportation Coordinating Committee, the Transportation and Air Quality Committee, and the full Atlanta Commission Region, Regional Board. Once the project receives the ARC go-ahead, Georgia DOT and the Federal Highway Administration sign off on it, and Federal Highway flexes the funds to the Federal Transit Administration. And then once that's done, jurisdictions such as Douglas County can apply to FTA for CMAC funds for their project. Okay, what was our project? Fixed route bus service. It was the number one recommendation of our transportation services study that we did back in 2015 and 2016. This bus service is designed to serve all residents of Douglas County 
not just the seniors and disabled. And the bus service would be an addition to the existing mobility services that we have through multimodal transportation. That includes our commuter van pools that take individuals to work, our voucher program for senior adults and disabled individuals, uh, the express bus service that was operated by Greta, which is now CERTA, uh, and our trip planning that we offer for, for seniors in particular, but any individuals who need help in, in trying to decide how they're going to get from one place to another. Okay, operational funding. Okay, this is the CMAC grant. For the first three years, it's a total of $6 million. That's $4.8 million in federal money. Uh, it would require a $1.2 million local match, and that would include the fares that we've received uh, for, from our passengers on the bus service. The industry standard in fare box recovery is about 25%. We would love to have 25%. We hope that we reach 25%. If we're able to do that, the county would be, have very little um, to put into the, the operational funds for those first three years. <clears throat> Talk a little bit about the, the CMAC timeline in this whole process. Back in 2017, we submitted a CMAC application to ARC. And as everyone, everyone knows, it's been a topic of conversation. We had two routes in that initial application. But in early summer 2017, ARC started suggesting to us that we revise our routes to score better in the CMAC competition. So we spent a lot of time in the summer of 2017 revising the routes as ARC had suggested. Uh, we went from those um, initial two routes to one route, back to two routes, to five routes, and finally the four that we settled on. So in October 2017, we submitted the applica an application supplement to the CMAC grant application with four routes, including a direct express route to the HE Homes MARTA station. In December 2017, we received initial uh, award notice of our grant from uh, the ARC. And in June of 2018, just a few weeks ago, ARC officially endorsed our Douglas uh, County CMAC application. Let's talk a little bit about the buses that, that we would be using. Uh, they're more like vans than buses. They carry 15 people. And the point uh, to note is the buses that would be using on our service are actually smaller than the buses being used by the Senior Citizens Program today. And you don't need a commercial driver's license to drive one of these buses. This is what we have to this date on our proposed schedule. We would operate 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Saturday. Uh, the fare is to be determined, but as Danielle Crow pointed out in our public input meetings that we had a few weeks ago, uh, $2 per one-way trip seemed to be a price point that everybody seemed, or most everybody seemed satisfied with. Okay, let's get to the routes, the nitty gritty of everything. We're proposing four routes. The first route is we're, we're calling Route 10 the Douglasville route. Uh, the areas that it would serve are North Douglasville, north of the railroad tracks, and what I call the, the old downtown area. Uh, it would serve the Chamber of Commerce, City Hall, the Conference Center, the old courthouse, and we looped down to uh, serve the library and the health center. Now this particular route is configured now. We do utilize a small stretch of Campbellton Street from Douglas County High School uh, up to Highway 78. Now it's never been our intention to use all of Campbellton Street. Uh, like South, 
of Douglas County High School down over the uh, expressway bridge to Chapel Hill Road. That's never been part of the plan. Um, so what we, what we are proposing to use is just that small stretch from the high school up to Highway 78. Route 20, we're calling it the, the Arbor Place Mall Route. Again, it serves a portion of North Douglasville, north of the tracks. We believe that that's one of our, will be one of our high ridership areas. Um, other points that we would be serving on this route include uh, the Boys and Girls Club, Hunter Park, uh, Walmart, Sam's, uh, Stewart Parkway, Highway 5, down uh, to the, the Kroger Shopping Center. And then we go back up uh, Douglas Boulevard uh, to the mall, uh, to the Target Shopping Center, we serve West Georgia Technical College, and then loop around and serve uh, the hospital, all the doctor's offices, uh, the courthouse. Okay, Route 30. It serves the Thornton Road Riverside drive area and this this route was particularly requested by the the development authority in a number of the warehouse distribution locations on thornton road and riverside parkway uh, this route would start uh, at the walmart on thornton road go south on thornton road to riverside parkway and then go out riverside parkway uh, to the american red cross facility Okay, Route 100, the HE Homes Direct Connect. Now, initially, what we were proposing for this route is for it to begin in Douglasville, uh, go east down I-20, make a stop on Thornton Road, a stop on Six Flags Drive, and then go all the way into Atlanta to the HE Homes uh, Morris Station. Now, there's been a lot of developments over the past week over the, this route and what we are proposing now uh, if we move forward is that we would stop this route in the Thornton Road area. It would not go out of Douglas County and it would not go all the way to the H.E. Holmes station. Um, what we are talking about though is having connectivity with that route to the Cobb Link and, and that would provide the continued uh, access into the HE home stations for individuals on this route. Now, if we're going to end this route on Thornton Road, that allows us the opportunity to reroute this route to serve more residents of the Lithia Springs area. And so we're presenting two options in that regard. The first option is that the, the, the vehicle would leave Douglasville. It would go east on I-20 to Lee Road. It would take a left on Lee Road up South Sweetwater to Skyview Drive. And it would go all the way up Skydrew, Skyview Drive, cross Thornton Road onto Oak Hill Road and make a connection at our park and ride lot and there's a a Cobb link stop up there that would be available to us. So that's one option. And the, some of the numbers on that particular route, uh, the population that it would serve is 9,214 and the jobs that it would provide access to is 8,576. Okay, option B. Again, we would leave Douglasville, go east on I-20 to Lee Road, go up South Sweetwater, but instead of uh, going on to Skyview Drive, we would go all the way up to Highway 78. We would go east on Highway 78 to Thornton Road, and that way we could serve uh, most of the area on Thornton Road south of I-20. Again, we would, um, turn on to Oak Ridge Road up to our parking ride lot, and that would provide us 
uh, that connectivity uh, with the Cobb system. This particular route would serve a population of 12,959 and would uh, be available to 10,575 jobs. A comparison of option A and option B. Option B serves, option B is, is the route that goes all the way up to Highway 78. It serves a population of 12,959 as opposed to option A's 9,214. You can also see that option B serves a little higher employment area and just a small uh, percentage higher in minorities. However, option A serves more people in poverty, more people, senior adults, and about the same number of people with disabilities. And for both routes, the number of uh, individuals with no vehicles is about the, about the same. Okay, both, both of these routes, as we said, would provide us connectivity with the Cobb Link system. We would actually be able to connect with eight other Cobb Link routes and to the Mars session at HE Homes without going out of Douglas County. Okay, still to do. First thing, board authorizes application with FTA. And, and let me repeat what we're, we're asking for today. We're asking for the board to authorize us to move forward with this application. It's for $4.8 million in federal money with a $1.2 million local match. Uh, we're asking you to look at, at four routes. Uh, the downtown Douglas route, the mall route, the Thornton Road Riverside route, and then for the fourth route, you have three options. You can have the direct express route to go all the way into Atlanta to the HE Homes Marta station uh, as we had planned initially. Uh, you can uh, look at uh, option A, which goes up Lee Road, uh, South Sweetwater to uh, Skyview Drive, or you can look at option B, uh, which goes up Lee Road, South Sweetwater, all the way to Highway 78 into Lithia Springs and then down Thornton Road. So that's, that's what we're asking today, is for authorization to move forward with those routes and your option, your choice of op the three options uh, on the express route. So, okay, let's, let's assume that you vote for us to go forward. What do we still need to do? Uh, we start developing the application. That includes refining the routes, I and mean, there will <coughs> still be a lot of of that, identifying stops along the routes. We would need to hire a third party operator who would be in charge of the actual day to day running of the vehicles. We need to establish our fares. Part of we're going to charge people to ride. We would need to order additional shuttles, cutaways to operate the service with. We would need to go ahead and informally introduce our Connect Douglas brand to the public. Uh, a key element in this whole process would be developing our, our schedules and other printed materials so the public would know exactly what we're doing. Uh, we'd have to draft operating procedures, safety procedures, uh, documents like that. Have to improve our web presence, social media presence, again, to where the public would know what we're doing and how they could utilize the system. And then there, there is going to be some hiring of, of additional staff uh, that would be necessary. But that's, that's what's brought us here today. And uh, we're to the, to the point that uh, the board does need to decide what direction uh, that they want the county to go in. Uh, we're, we're kind of at a standstill with uh, what to do next. 
without direction from the board. Any questions from the board? Vice Chairman Robinson. Uh, thank you. All right. I'm not going to belabor this. I'm going to save all my, my debate points for tomorrow. Uh, it, it would be a waste of time and, and really energy and defeats the point of strategy. Um, but two quick comments. Um, it, it's important to acknowledge that the Transportation Committee has not seen your, your route modification Correct. regarding 100. Correct. I got that right. Um, I'm seeing it for the very first time. And, and so um, I, I think it's something that needs to, we'll, we'll take up um, in tomorrow's Transportation Committee. And I believe that a recommendation needs to become for to the Board of Commissioners as our, you know, make a recommendation. And, and whether the board votes or not on that uh, point, it, it's up to the board. But I, I do want to clarify um, how we got here with the, the route modification uh, or suggestion by staff. Um, again, I love ACCG. It's something about that when you get with your colleagues. And I had the, the privilege of, of talking to uh, my counterpart across the river, um, 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 in essence. Uh, Vice Chairman of Cobb County, Lisa Cupid, and we agreed that we perhaps need to get together and, um, and she agreed with me to create an atmosphere in which our two administrations could talk transportation. Now, again, at that time, the, the, the 930, all that was going on, but we were already in motion for what we're doing locally. One is not related to the other. You can have parallel paths of anything in life. Um, nothing is linear, all right? So we, we acknowledge that. Uh, we were just able to get, um, have a meeting uh, we had this past Friday. Um, she hosted it in Cobb County at the Epicenter, which is Word of Faith. We want to thank them for hosting us at their beautiful facility. Uh, we had a county administrator there. Um, we had our um, director of transportation and our uh, director of transit, um, multimodal there, and those counterparts. And then we had external affairs there as well. And the whole point was just to sort of create this atmosphere of just sharing. It had nothing to do with Route 100. It was about how are we handling transportation in general? How are we handling transit? And, and so I, it was one of those where it was just more of an observation just to, to listen to the experts talk. And it was sort of like four peas in a pod because they, they went off on path, down a path and they were sharing technology in real time and what the Cobb system was in comparison to what we were trying to do. And yes, they're on three year money as well. And it was just, uh huh. Um, and again, they acknowledge that there is a seasonal effect of transportation ebb and flow, and there's nothing different. And it was very, very seasoned, right? Very, very seasoned. And it was just it was a good conversation. And so then the premise came up of, of, of should there, not could there, would there, but should there be some consideration to um, dealing with the H.E. Holmes route, right? Um, and it was acknowledgement that has been out there. It is something that my, my counterpart, Commissioner Mulcair, has brought up in transportation as being his one sticking point regarding our program, um, which is, you know, out of county. Now, again, we won't get in how people come into our grid outside of our county and get into our system. And we, we contribute to that as a regional. And so this, okay, it's regional. Everything is related. We're not Pluto. We're not in our own little cosmic world. We are part of a bigger system. And it was important that somebody, we, we had to align ourselves. But that being said, uh, and again, just by, by way of background, it was determined that, um, well, could we change our routes? Could we? Right? We, it was just exploration. This from Friday to today, I did not know the staff worked this hard to get here. Right? So I don't know the conversation they had afterwards or where they were, but it was one of those, could we do it? You know, there's the number 30 that obviously I catch right there by the sheriff's office to go down to H.E. Holmes. But um, likewise, there's a 25 that actually comes down Sheriff Street onto Maxim Road into our county, back down Maxim, I mean, on Thornton, then on Maxim. So this cross transversance of, of jurisdiction has always happened. It's nothing new. You may not know, you may not come in that part of the county, but it wasn't that it didn't exist. Right? And so that means that people were going back and forth between two counties quite easily, getting on each other's system. Okay. Um, I, I, and I bring that up with this whole notion of, you know, should we change? Right? It only made sense when you think about it by our, our Route 100 and their Route 30. Actually, the epicenter was the perfect place to have our meeting because that's where the two routes combine. Right there, they go down Six Flags Drive and they hit I-20 out to H.E. Holmes. 
right? So the question is, well, why do we have two buses, right, going down the same path, right? And that's all it really does, right? Um, you know, it's just two buses going down the same path. And there was some logic behind, like, well, if there's a way in which we could talk to our peers and say, hey, look, can, can we, would you willing to pick up our people or vice versa or, and that was really up to staff to sort of work through that. It wasn't that it couldn't be done, it was just the fact that was there any interest in even having the conversation? This is not that the first time I brought up a consideration and my peer, uh, Commissioner Merker knows it, like, well, look, we could work through this if we wanted to, but I'm not gonna force compromise, right? In other words, like, well, okay, well, staff, I'm gonna let y'all create this atmosphere, let y'all sort of work it out, see what y'all can do and stuff, but at the end of the day, if nobody wants to hear change or consideration, then let it lie. Right, so now I'm, I'm saying this to say, I don't know what position, I, I mean, since this is a work session, um, I need to get to the Transportation Committee to really think through what I just heard. That's a totally different play. Now, I appreciate the fact that you've overlaid the route back in, and that's something, of course, I brought up is like, if I consider anything, that means I'm not giving up the points or those mileage. We need to serve a greater group of people, right? It needs to be inclusive, right? Um, and I appreciate your comments that it wasn't um, always about seniors and disabled. It never was. I appreciate you saying that Riverside has always been on the table, Thornton Road, which means if the premise is economic development, if seniors are getting off like, look, we're trying to retire out, we ain't trying to expand our capacity, well, that doesn't fulfill economic development. Disabled, such as me, like, look, we're still trying to get engaged, we're very productive, so we need, you know, okay, I could argue that, but there's part-time workers, there's, you know, people who work the mall, right, the minimum wage, this Riverside, which is a better quality of life argument, right? So the premise that this was all about economic development and we only want to serve seniors and the disabled, like, okay, that you can't get there from here. That is a flawed approach because you're, you're missing maybe half the population of the needs that were identified, right? And so uh, again, when we make our votes, all of us look from our vantage point on while we render a decision. So if it's 5-0, we all looked at it like, okay, how can I agree with that decision? There was something in that decision that I saw myself in that represents my respective area that I'm responsible for, right? We weigh in, right? right? That's important. So I'm, I'm gonna close with not a lot of comments and stuff other than um, I need some time to think about what I just heard at least till tomorrow. Um, um, this is new, but again, compromises come at the last minute. Um, I, I, I hope my, my peers would support, um, obviously, um, a little bit more fleshing out uh, with the Transportation Committee uh, to make a recommendation as we've done most of these things. Uh, but at the same point, I agree, you need to get that input from the citizens that that study um, outreach just did. I think that was key, Gary, that, that they, in addition to this, they need to hear what the citizens said. So I. I'm going to have to agree with, with Commissioner Mitchell that, that, that we can't neglect that step, right? So let's make sure that as we consider this, we, we've got some homework to do in 24 hours, but I, I think that's important. Input from the citizens, not just the fact that we've got this 100-page document, but the fact that we actually consider what they said, and likewise work through any outstanding issues that may exist, um, and we'll see where it lies. So I'm going to yield for now, Madam Chair. Thank okay. you. Okay. Any other comments from the Board of Commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Guider? Commissioner, where do we where do we even start? Um, you are saying in a public meeting that you have not had conversation with Commissioner Robinson on all of this. Commissioner Robinson is aware of what we're doing. All right, just want to make that clear. Uh, again, transparency, M Madam Chair, does not. Is, is not a, a, we don't have transparency on this board. We have told you before, we wrote you a letter, me and Malcare, uh, Commissioner Malcare wrote you a letter when we first found out that Martyr had been invited to contact our staff by uh, Commissioner Robinson and nothing was done. So transparency is out the window. Um, let me just start, first of all, 
I have I've researched all the minutes uh, from our very the very first time in 2015 when the recommendations came out. Most of those recommendations, there's a list that you sent around that you gave us um, that listed what we could go ahead and do using these smaller recommendations as we talked about our, in our resolution. Um, in 2017, 2000, uh, I mean, to November 17, 2015, Randy, he's quoted as, it continues to be what we want to provide good intra-county services, circular system services. That has not been accomplished yet. Um, all those li the, the lists that you put out, many of those have not been accomplished yet. Uh, uh, increase in Greta bus services, uh, more van pools, and, and things such as that. And let me just point out the revenues of the, those two programs, van pools and Greta buses, is down 45 percent since 2014 since 2014, but all these estimates that we have been given for the past three years, they, they just keep going this way and that way, and, and we don't know what this thing is gonna cost us. Van Poole um, ridership is down 22% since 2014. Greta buses is down 32%, and just uh, the routes have decreased 28%. One-way ridership has decreased 33%. That's just people that might want to go to Atlanta one day. Um, but the revenues speak for themselves. And um, I have asked twice in public meetings, if we accept this grant, will we have to accept the four routes that were spelled out in that grant, and I have been told twice, yes. This is the first time anybody on this board except um, possibly uh, Commissioner Robinson and, chair, and the chairman, I'm sure she's been in the loop. Uh, this is the first time we have heard any of these changes. This is not the way you implement any kind of system haphazardly changing it one day from the other estimates one day is a million dollars and that's two million dollars annually from the very uh, consultant that we hired kinetics is saying two million dollars but what system is it based on now you're talking about four different routes going every which way we don't know what that's going to cost but um Back in 2016, when we were talking about this study, it said, um, Henry Mitchell, uh, you asked the question about, um, are we gonna be moving, pe this is strictly about Douglas County, or uh, moving people around Douglas County and not Atlanta, Fulton, and any other place. And Mr. Cochran said both. To move people within the county where the county residents are going um, in our community for jobs, but then uh, some of the folks are commuting to Alabama in the van pools, some midtown, some downtown, some the CDC, some the Emory, so it's both. But he was talking about van pools. So we were always talking about the two bus routes. That was in our application, our original application. In November, uh, 2016, Kelly Robinson, C Commissioner Kelly Robinson, wrote a memo to us saying, um, there is no funding for the bus system who we know will not exceed $1 million based upon our benchmark to Cherokee County. Our benchmark to Cherokee County. How many bus routes did Cherokee County have? One. One. Now we are growing and growing, and uh, later on in uh, 2017, January 2017, um, 
Commissioner Robinson said, it's probably not a good idea to mix millennials with the greatest generation, in other words, the elderly, when we were talking about the senior center, the one senior and the youth center. We're not gonna mix them, yet we're gonna put them all on a bus. And th all of the minutes always, always stress the seniors and the disabled people. We were gonna have a, a, a call to ride system. We were gonna have a volunteer a group of people to help the seniors get on the buses. Yet we're going to pile all these people on these these vans. Um, we've always, uh, in March 17, 2017, Randy said, maximized ridership is what is wanted before adding extra routes. Both routes are 12 miles each an hour in modest traffic and we'll run 15 hours a day. Um, in April of that same year, in the Board of Commissioners meeting, Commissioner Robinson said, I know we have two routes currently. We came, that, they, they came out of the transportation study. In May 15th, 2017, the resolution that we, we turned in said the bus system that will provide circulated and access services in the, in the county, in the county. Um, May 16th, and this is the funny one, 2017, Commissioner Robinson said, we're gonna take our time. We're gonna do a pilot program and get this right. We believe in transparency. And then just a couple of months later, he's sneaking off down to Atlanta, inviting, asking ARC, can you uh, collaborate and get us a meeting with Martyr, with our staff? But he forgot to tell y'all, didn't he? He didn't tell y'all that he was instigating this meeting. He says it, and then later on he says, it's okay. Why can't we talk to these other people? But why did he have to hide it if he was so proud of it? That is not transparency. And that's when Commissioner Mulcair and I wrote a letter to the chairman about the clandestine meeting. I'm quoting uh, <laughs> Commissioner Mulcair. And for those of, those, uh, those of you that may not know what that means, it says, as forbidden, forbidden, forbidden by laws, rules, or custom. Gary, you were in the newspaper, um, and you, you put in the newspaper, we do a great job getting people outside the county, but we, we need to improve on getting people around to their doctor offices and things like that. You put out a report to us on August the 2nd of 2017, where, as you said, while Marta was at the table, Marta wants the direct line from Douglas County to H.E. Homes. Up to that point, ARC was looking at reducing our two routes down to one, but all of a sudden, when it, they came back to us after we had submitted our application, they wanted four routes one including a direct line to Martyr. Um, now this issue about Martyr is not a Republican or Democrat issue. It's not a black or white issue. It is about crime. I will say that Atlanta, out of the top 10 cities of the United States, is number six in violent crimes. Do you want people coming out here bringing drugs to drop off to your kids at the mall? You better consider this is, this is a game changer when we start talking about this. Um, but the motion to go ahead with this CMAC grant application, it was submitted with this amended four, four routes way before we knew it. 
the, this board. There, there's probably a couple of on the board that may have known it, but we didn't know it. The board as a whole, we re, you know, we represent the county as a whole, even though we're elected out of a district. Because when we vote, it's going to have a, a an effect on everybody. Everybody's going to pay for this. It is going to raise our budget two million dollars annually after it runs out. We and everybody knows you don't ever put out services, have services, and then take them back. That's when the names start call, being called. But the Board of Commissioners didn't know about this uh, adding the four routes until six days after it had already been done by the Transportation Committee and their transparency to this board. Um, Cobb County, like someone said today, is cutting routes. Carroll County, they've come up with a pretty good idea. They've got their flex bus. They started out with one route, now they are adding another one. And their route, their pay is, uh, our fare is $3 for one way, $6 for a uh, round trip. And that's where they call it, it's a flex bus system where they call and make an appointment. But um, this thing, all of a sudden, has a different face on it. And we are expected to vote on this tomorrow? There's no way. And this was done deliberately. This was done deliberately. And if you look at all the routes, they're all mostly in District 1 and, and 2. That's where most of the added routes have been added. Um, Carroll County's bus route is going to cost them $35,000 a year. Ours is going to cost us $2 million a year plus because the estimates, we don't know what the estimates are on these new routes. Connecticut had already said $2 million on the other two routes, the ones going out of town. But if we're so concerned, you know, uh, Commissioner Mitchell has often talked about we sh maybe we should think twice before we roll the millage rate back when we have uh, assessment increases. Well, when you do that, it, the, it does kind of take the sting out of some of the uh, uh, new taxes that people are going to have to pay. But he ought to be thinking 10 times harder on this. This is adding $2 million to the annual budget from here on out. But we don't even know that the $2 million figure is correct. But Gary, I have asked you twice in two open meetings about this. Will we be obligated to the four routes that ARC came back with? And I was told twice, yes. Has that changed? There was so much discussion and negativity about the HE Homes direct route that we went back to ARC and asked them if we could When look. did you go back? This, like I said, all of this happened last week. This is, this has happened so quickly that we really haven't had an opportunity to put it out in, in front of Well, you haven't had an opportunity to put it out to us and we haven't had an opportunity to digest it. Yet we're supposed to vote on it tomorrow? There is no way we should be able to, or even be uh, asked to do this. This is just not good leadership. And I just, uh, first of all, it should not be on the agenda item. It certainly should not be on the agenda item, but I think it ought to be table until we have more time to digest it and I want to, in writing, the ARC is okay, is okay with not going down to, uh, does it go down Riverside Drive into Cobb County? No. It, it has taken that route out too. But it's all, again, just like the, the senior center and the youth center is all on the eastern side, but they're wanting the western side to help pay for it. 
We all are going to pay for it. What happened in DeKalb, in, uh, DeKalb County is uh, they had their own system, and then they couldn't afford to run it anymore. And lo and behold, they had to turn it over to martyr. Now the citizens of that county has a martyr tax. So that's, what, that's the way this thing happens. We have not had a chance to digest this. This is highly uncalled for on such a hot issue. <clears throat> the citizens haven't even had any input on this. So we definitely need to present it to the citizens. We've been telling them one story all along, and all of a sudden, everything's changed overnight, and nobody knew about it. I'll never believe that one, never. This is, um, this is shoddy. This whole business is nothing but shoddiness. And I yield back. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Guider. I believe uh, Commissioner Mulk here, you had a comment. Yes. <clears throat> I largely support Commissioner Guider's remarks. Uh, a lot of research, attention to detail. So I thank her for that. Uh, I have a couple of very specific, simple questions. Uh, what is the round trip mileage of uh, option A and option B? That's one of the things that I look at in terms of operating costs. I, I don't have the round trip mileage um, on those. I do have the, op, the annual operating costs for those two routes. They're, it's basically the same. Okay, I just, uh, when you can, get uh, email, email all of us uh, uh, what the round trip uh, distances for the option A and okay. the option B so that I can calculate the uh, per mile funding uh, that would potentially come from, from the grant. That's how I, my mind works. Was it, was it gonna, how's it gonna be funded per mile? Uh, I know it's, per mile is hugely less funding than uh, the very first uh, two route recommendation resolution that went uh, uh, to the ARC. Uh, we're going from, uh, what, 8 million to, to 6 million and almost almost twice as many miles with the, uh, with the HE Holmes route, which uh, brings me to my, uh, I guess, the, the one point with uh, Commissioner Guider that I disagree with. Uh, with me, it's, it's not MARTA and crime. It's the fact that uh, Douglas County would be undertaking a, uh, a regional operation uh, rather than a local operation. And to me, you know, we've got a new uh, transit authority, and the a ATL, uh, that's uh, been in place by the General Assembly. That's their job to determine what, uh, what the regional approach uh, would be. Uh, it's not up to Douglas County to be approaching uh, regional uh, operations and, and regional funding. So that's that's the only point I disagree with uh, uh, Ms. Ms. Guider, Commissioner Guider on. So if you'd get me that information, uh, I'd appreciate it. Oh, uh, and one uh, uh, question. Uh, I've heard it several times, and I've heard two different answers, and that was in reaching out to the city. And yeah, when we requested, a, I guess, a substantiating letter from the city, uh, my recollection was, well, we don't know anything about this. Uh, could you, from your recollection and being closer to the issue, would you uh, tell me if the city was in the loop, if you will, from the, from the get-go, or was it later, or did they, whatever. Just tell me about that. Well, there's a couple of parts to that. First of all, city staff has been involved in this process from the very beginning, even when we started the transportation services study back in 2015, the city had a representative at our kickoff meeting. Um, a city staff member uh, was interviewed one-on-one -on -one as a part of the transportation services study along with about 15 other community leaders. Uh, I had one one-on-one -on -one meeting with the city staff mem member, and I communicated with that city staff member on, a, on several occasions through emails. And um, I, 
I direct, told that city staff member that if there were other uh, individuals in the city government that needed to see that information to please pass it along to them. So in that respect, the city uh, was, had some idea of what was going on. Now, as far as the letter that, that you're addressing, that when Randy Hulsey and I were working on the application, we did want to get letters of support from the community. Mm -hmm. um, I approached the Chamber of Commerce the development authority and the accountability courts risk requesting letters of support, which I got from them. Um, Randy said that he would approach Mayor Robinson. Now, what what we wanted to do, we we weren't asking the mayor for a letter of full support from the council. We were asking for a letter from her as mayor for support. And somehow that got miscommunicated to the, to the mayor what we were asking for, because that's the same thing that we asked the, the chamber executive director and the director of the development authority for, and we got letters from them. So as far as the city council not, not being brought in on it, that's true, but that was never the intention of us asking for that letter. Okay, so I, what I what the way I read that then is that uh, perhaps there was a, a breakdown of what could have been communicated internally within the city, that we did our job in uh, in interacting with your counterparts uh, within the city, and then somehow the communication was not thorough enough. Yes, sir. And apparent to that. Okay, I yield back. Thank you, Mitchell. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, Randy. I mean, Randy, I'm sorry. Gary, just a couple of quick questions. Piggybacking on Commissioner Mulcair comments in reference to uh, the mayor and council not knowing or knowing. Um, I guess my first question, does the mayor and Madam Chair sit on the ARC, correct? Correct. Okay. Well, with that being said, uh, Michelle Wright, and I think Randy Holsey then, but uh, oh, during that time, um, as early as 2015 moving forward, had knowledge of this information as it was evolving from two routes, four routes, different routes, and all the changes. That would be correct, or? Randy had knowledge of it, but, but I was the contact and I got with it, Michelle. But, but I'm only trying to allude that, that who knew or who didn't know. So now the city job is to inform, well, to seek the information as well to be informed in reference to that. But I was just only making sure that Mayor Robinson and Madam Chair sits on the ARC. Where this information was evolving and where it was going, I'm not trying to question where it went, but there was both parties from the city and the county that sat on these boards or and on these committees and had full knowledge of any changes or any directions or whatever that, whatever it evolved into. Is that not correct or that's incorrect? I, I don't know if, how much of this staff level, level knowledge reached the full ARC board that Madam Chair and the Mayor well, um, most of this was between uh, our staff and ARC staff. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Now, my next question is, let's move right along. Okay. Speaking of this pilot program, um, in the beginning, there were two routes. Now we're down to four routes. Do you have or are there any concerns with this whole process of kind of what it evolved into as to where we are today. Do you have any concerns with, with the now routes that's being proposed and, and with the whole, all the changes that I'm seeing on um, the A and B routes? Um, yes, I got it. The A and B routes that I notice here now, um, just these changes that 
are we hoping that ARC will accept this, or are you saying that you've already submitted the possibility of what these routes could be or may? We, or we asked them if we could do that, and their answer was yes, basically, basically yes, that all you would need to do is, is to notify us that you're making the change. Notify them or the Federal Highway Commission? Which, notify which ARC. ARC that these, these changes are. And if I heard um, Vice Chair Robinson, will this not only be public to the general public to understand what these possible routes are because, um, and um, at what point do we actually make sure that the general public have knowledge of what this could be or what the possibilities are versus whether, I mean, is it ready for a vote, I'm alluding to. Is it ready for a vote? And I, I, you don't, I'm not asking you to answer this question, but is it ready for the vote? Or is it ready to go back to committee to say what the recommendations are and then for this board, well, after public input, and then this board decide on what that, that is? I, well, what I think needs to be done is that the, this most recent change about the, the direct route to HE Homes, that needs to go before the Transportation Committee tomorrow and let them review it and then make a recommendation and then come back uh, before the board. I think, I think before we go out to the public again that the board needs to make some kind of final determination on are these the routes that we want to go forward forward with it's it's my opinion that the that the routes that we present to you today uh, with the a and b alternates uh, for the direct route are the best routes for us to go forward with at gotcha. this particular time understood understood but but again as commissioner guider kind of i think the concerns are are, are we putting the cart before the horse meaning that we allow the citizens to have their input on any of these, I mean, not some of these routes, yes, but not all of these as the recommendation from hopefully it would have been from the uh, transportation committee first, then some kind of community or whatever input then um, is that not a, a decent process or because it's about the process and, and as uh, as spoken earlier as to my comments about the transportation no the transparency and the lack of transparency has been my earlier concerns I've always supported the project the transportation project but somehow we got derailed and we made other we made others uh, um, statements or changes, not you, but other changes were made that this board didn't have any knowledge of, which sparked my interest of, wait a minute, what happened, who made the change, and why the change was made. I've always said that the routes and wherever they are should be determined by ridership, not by I want it in my neighborhood or not by ridership. Um, will any of these routes by chance touch one another to kind of coexist with another to kind of make sure that um, when, it, when going from route to route, whether it's A, B, or C, they will touch to kind of continue? Okay, so. Absolutely. So. That's, that's one of the key factors in, in how we designed them, that they do have connectivity with each other. Right. And ARC is not overly concerned about a regional project because it makes me think about when I went to Washington at the transportation, uh, federal tr transportation committee there speaking on the federal uh, dollars that got the Highway 92 bypass, they, they pushed the regional process, but as long as the city was trying to move it when I was there as the mayor pro tem, it wouldn't move just from the fact that we didn't have the dollars and cents to pull this off. So is ARC looking for a regional project from Douglas County, or they don't have uh, uh, any concerns outside of locally. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say they're looking for a regional project. What they do want is connectivity to where somebody who's riding our system 
can connect with the Cobb system or the MARTA system. Got it. So that's why the Holmes piece was recommended and uh, the Cobb Thornton Road piece was brought. Right. Okay. Got it. Um, is MARTA a part of intertwined with this particular mobile transportation? No. Okay. Now, if, if we had continued our route into HE Homes, we would have had to have some agreement with MARTA allowing our, our vehicles to go into their, their station. But if, if we go with this system that we're proposing today where we connect with Cobb and Cobb makes uh, the rest of the trip into HE Homes, we don't have any uh, discussion with MARTA because Cobb already has the, the authority to go into the home station. Right. So that'll be on from the Thornton Road perspective Correct. versus, okay, got you. Um, as we know, this pilot program is a three-year possible pilot program. And our current uh, dollars and cents annually is what again? Our annual dollar amount for, for the proposed system. Yes, for the proposed. Uh, yeah. Two point two million, one point one point six federal each year, four hundred thousand local each year. Got you. <coughs> At what point, when we were dealing with a two route possible system, did it get to a four route possible system? Roughly, you remember roughly what what was that roundabout time? When it went from two to four. Yes. That was a process that basically went through all of all of last summer, and again, the the driving force behind that was that ARC kept telling us that the routes that we were submitting weren't going to score, score well in the CMEC process, and that's when we brought in uh, our consultant Kinetics to help us formalize routes that that ARC would accept. And that's when we submitted the four routes, and that's what helped us to get the grant. Got you. Okay, and last but not least, um, I'll save the rest of my comments for tomorrow. Uh, but it appears that maybe this item might want to be moved, Madam Chair, off the uh, consent agenda first. Right. And second of all, um, the 100 page document is where I think I have some concerns that I don't know if I'm going to have time to read, be a part of, and understand 100 page documents and ready for tomorrow. Well, that, just, may, I, may I say this, oh, Commissioner? Sure, say, yeah, uh, right ahead. I'll, certainly, I'm going to, to get you that information this afternoon as quickly as I can get uh, back to my office, mm -hmm. but honestly, all the information is, is in, that is in there is information that you know already. There's, no, there's not going to be any surprises. Oh, okay. Any. Got you. But, but still, just from a practical purpose, I, I just, I got to know. Sure. And I can't assume uh, that I knew that was already in there. I'd rather read it again and know that was in there before that process get there. So that. That document, I wish we'd had it, you know, had had it sooner. And then I, I just think it's it's not totally fair with the the lack of transparency that I speak about. That for the general public to have had at least a chance to have their say so with it as well. Not that they're for it or against it. That's not my purpose. Or that's not my reasoning for making that statement. But at least they could have called their commissioners and said like it, don't like it, add it, take away, you know, and not to say that their changes would have been made, but at least it would have been acknowledged. So I, I would love to kind of get ahead of that, but I see now though, but it, it appears that we're, we're kind of moving and, and I guess tomorrow it would be supposed to be a vote versus let's pump the brakes one more time or several more times and make sure that not only do we know as a board, but the citizens as well have had at least a chance to have their input yet along just knowing what that what that looks like so outside of that I'll say my other comments oh one last thing 
uh, Commissioner Guider mentioned something about me talking about rollbacks. I don't know where that came from. I don't know what that really, <laughs> all that mean. Uh, minutes. Say what now? The minutes. No, no, no. Well, I was saying it doesn't have anything, any meaning to what we're talking about now. <laughs> yes, it has it have meaning, but it, for what's going on now, I, just, I didn't quite know, know where that comment was going about rollbacks or not rollbacks. But I won't comment. I only want to comment on what's going on today of what this is versus whether or not I'm for or against the rollback. So I'll yield, Madam Chair, and um, I'll say my other comments for tomorrow. Thank you. Commissioner Mulk, I believe you have one yeah. additional question. Uh, a follow-up question I think I asked before. Uh, you know, the original two routes were funded, I think, at $8 million, and, then we, and then we amended the application, and we ended up with uh, four routes at $6.5 million. Now we're talking about route changes again, and conceivably the number of routes. Will that have an implication on the uh, grant amount? Will Will uh, ARC or, or the federal government determine, okay, well, you, before you were talking about four routes, of six, five, and now you're talking uh, three routes uh, or a modified four routes, is it going to be something less than the 6.5? Or do you have a sense of whether they want to modify that grant amount? If we're modifying our request, wouldn't that give them an open door to well, modify the grant well, amount? Well, there, there's not going to be any impact in this sense. The the four routes that we submitted back in October uh, to the Atlanta Regional Commission, the budget for them was the 4.8 million federal and the 1.2 million local. Mm -hmm. Now, last week, as, as we were quickly looking at the alterations to the uh, HE Homes route right. and cutting it back to Thornton Road and then adding the, the, the routes through Lithia Springs to serve that, that community, uh, the budget numbers that Kinetics, our um, consultant, put together for those, actually there, there's no change. In fact, what they're showing is that alternate A or alternate B would actually be a couple of thousand dollars less than the HE Homes route. So the short answer to your question is no, sir, there's, there's no budget impact. Well, on changing these yeah, routes. You just said there would be uh, several thousand dollars less, so, that, so there would be a, a small uh, grant change no no there wouldn't there wouldn't be any that that change is so insignificant that there wouldn't be any, any change in the grant amount okay All right, I yield back thank you okay vice chairman Robinson yeah I just real quick clarity and I again we, we we've been doing this what we've been together for eight years um, for the most part as a board I'm talking about the dish I'm gonna do the best oh no. I'll do the best I can how about that That's a little better all right, watch it now. Uh, yeah, um, again, we've been working together for about eight years, and some of the narrative goes off task. We, we, we tell storylines, right? Uh, we don't tell full stories. We pull stuff out of things. And I just, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. It's not necessary. We pretty much know where we are. Whatever arguments we want to build, it's like, guys, we're not 20-something. We're 50-plus which means we know what we're looking at. All the undertones, all of that, it's like, okay, guys, we know what we are. I'm just gonna make three comments about comments that were made earlier, because Commissioner Mulker knew I was gonna go there. Is when I said I was gonna slow this bus system down since we were talking about minutes, I did, right? The whole point is that if I left it to staff with rain them, they were pushing this bus system fast, right? Think about the meeting when it blew up when he actually got escorted out. Right? It was about the bus contract. Right? Don't make me go there. Right? So I slowed it down and said, okay, there's too much going on with this bus contract. Let me slow this thing down. Right? I did slow it down. We paused. We didn't even move on it. Right? Second thing is that we slowed it down is that when we were talking about doing operational, um, doing the branding and so forth. I think it was what, about October or so, you came before us and Madam Chair asked us politely to say, could we make a pause on this? Let's wait till we get to this budget process. So once again, we slowed it down twice. Again, we tell our stories. We fit them to however we want to, but it's like, okay, that's not really true. Twice I slowed it down. One for education and the other part was about the contract. In other words, because staff was moving this thing. 
And it was like, well, we had a transition administration, so we wanted to slow that down. I had to make those two points. They're minor, but they're material enough. Like, no, that's not how that went down. The last part is about meetings, guys. My meetings are pretty available, right? No, I don't, I, I, one more time, I don't do back doors. That's y'all culture. I don't do side of the roads. I don't do that. I went and met, um, the first time I met with, um, obviously, Marta. And, and think about how this went down, guys. There's four approaches to this. Do it yourself, third party operator, county to county, or what we want to call the Marta, right? C class, E class, S class, AMG. We've documented that. We documented, I looked at all four. So as any commissioner who's doing due diligence, I want to look at, okay, what is the right one to look at that fits us? And I'm going to go have conversation. I don't need permission from my peers to go have a conversation to do due diligence. No more than anybody else. So if I want to go over there and talk to like, okay, now what does it take to do, Marta? I want to see firsthand. So the very first meeting I went to, it was our, they were mentioning delegation. Well, our uh, members of our delegation, uh, my, my senator, uh, Donzella James, and Roger Bruce and Kimberly Alexander all took me over with our lobbyists over to meet Marta. It's a public meeting. Uh-huh. On that same day, the Chairman Tom Worthen is in Washington talking about something. I had no clue he was there. Ooh, how convenient. It's like, oh, you're talking about transportation. Then he found out I'm talking about transportation, but it was like, oh, okay. Look at our interests. Look at how we flowed. He had a little entourage of, you know, I think it was the chamber, some other people went with him, and they were up there talking about federal dollars, and I'm over here. So again, we can move independently. That's the whole point. Go do your homework and come back with an educated decision. So when I hear this, it's like, what is wrong with y'all? Right? And it's somewhat about control. It's about controlling how a person thinks, how they move. And it's like, no, we're free to move. We're free to explore on behalf of our citizens to figure out, okay, what is in the best interest, right? So this meeting coming this, this past Friday, it's on my calendar. It's no big deal. It was in the public. It wasn't hidden. It was in a rec center. Anybody could have sat there. It wasn't that it was hidden or ain't he doing this. It was like, I want to meet with my peer. I want to know what are y'all doing over there? It's open record. It's funny how people talk about open records. Like what? I'm going over here to hear what they got to say. Like, no, what y'all doing? Okay. Right. We went to Cherokee. We took the same team almost, right? Did different players and so forth. Let's go see what they're doing. Right? Randy came up with the half million dollar per route. That's about right, Cherokee, one million dollars. Okay, four times five is two million. Okay, not hard. Gets us right there. This ain't rocket science. Right? You can get relatives to see that, okay, we, we took our time. Yes. Process-wise, there was nothing happened between Friday and now where I hadn't seen anybody, right? My meeting on Friday was my meeting. I come back, I told you I had a meeting. Staff wanted to present something. I'm like, okay, I did not ask staff to go and say, to try to get a vote. The, the, the narrative was simply this. Well, we think, well, M Commissioner Moak here had a concern about this, so we believe that we could, you know, we may be able to adjust this. I said, okay. I wasn't thinking to change his mind because I've had my personal conversations with him. Right, where he had a pretty ironclad position about what this was. But okay, staff, let's see what you got. So between Friday and now, I, had, I have not seen this. Right? Don't do that. Don't try to paint like, no, let's, well, let's see what staff does. Because again, we're governors. That's the administration. So my job, like, okay, let's see what they do. But I got a transportation committee I got to get to. I haven't seen it. I haven't processed this. I haven't seen the routes. I have not seen how it was going to do anything. That's not true. Right? But did I, I create the atmosphere that allowed us to talk? Did we go do our homework? I didn't sit there and say, well, why you got to talk to Marta? Like, well, why not? They're a partner. And then the funny thing is that you, you, I, I, I foresaw this, that we are part of a bigger region. And it's funny how, at the same time, we're, we're, we're talking out both sides of our mouth when we turn around and talk about, well, won't you work but wait for Greta and so forth? I said, you know Marta's driving that, right? Like, like duh. Are you paying attention? Right? This is my challenge is that when I hear these commentaries, I'm like, come on, guys. We wouldn't get some good information. We got a feel for what Marta looked like. Okay, what does that mean for us? Somebody had to go have a conversation. I took it upon myself. Let's go look at another county to county. Let's see what they do. Let's see what the impact is. So all this, well, why are you over there? Like, that's what I'm supposed to do. 
See, the problem is that I'm not in a, this little, this bubble, this colony, and ah, we don't want it. I, I get this, guys. I get the urbanization. I've always understood this. And I've always believed that there's a way to do this that is the best of both worlds. She's right. Half the county probably could benefit from this. Half of it doesn't. Okay, that's the way it works. Half the, you know, some people don't want, want the jail. Some people did. It is what it is. Everybody don't benefit from it. It doesn't prevent crime. I can sit here and I can argue all day on any narrative. I'm like, okay, I'm not gonna waste my time, right? I'm really not gonna waste your time, right? At the end of the day, it just comes down to choice. Do we have adequate information to make a decision, right? The route last minute that the staff tried to do, which is try to respond as administration, respond to sort of the Congressional General Assembly, the commission side, say, okay, he has an issue. No more than Madam Chair say, okay, Commissioner Robinson, go figure out what Mitchell, Mitchell, Commissioner Mitchell's issue is. They're trying to respond, right? So they came up. I mean, I created an atmosphere to even allow that. It wasn't no back door. It was obvious that Holmes was an issue. He's a partner on my transportation committee. He knows I've come to him, and he's like, for whatever reason, I'm going to let him stand on his position that, well, you know, I knew we could have probably changed this, but it's like, well, let the process play out. There's nothing that we have to change anything going into tomorrow's meeting. We just got some last minute, like anything last minute, quit acting new about legislative matters. Things at the last minute at the General Assembly go very fast. That last night, people are cutting deals, trying to shape things, get things done. There's no shotgun here. You've had adequate time to look at this, per se. Make sure they get their information. At the end of the day, we'll come back on the other side of this. But again, all of this storyline is like, come on, guys. We look at this for what it is. You make your call, and we move from there. But I, I, I don't, I, I, I promise them, just, you know, I believe in the Second Amendment, like this guy, like, don't go there. And we can have a very good conversation and debate. But, the, the, you know, sort of the innuendo is like, no, guys, it, it ain't, nobody, I don't have to trick anybody or anything like that. You just, you're up front. Like, look, we're looking at this. We want to see what is in the best interest of the county for the fulfillment of economic development. Just like we have people over there that met line, all these guys, they, they're like, well, look, we pay taxes too. We, we want our voice recognized. And again, I get this whole argument, guys. You know, I don't want to get into the haves, haves not. I don't want to get into the middle class argument. Really, I'm really good, that good at that. And they're like, I don't really want to go there, right? Because at the end of the day, yes, it's an ebb and flow about how taxes are applied. At the end of the day, this is about appropriations, right? You know, you have some that believe, like, only me, not you, or if I don't want that, nobody gets nothing, right? I get that. I don't prescribe to that ideology. I believe in a more inclusive, right? That we all rise, right? A little bit different. That's what I'm saying, okay, I can get right down to what this is really about, but I'm, I'm okay. I'm allow the process to work its way out. I, I mean, I, I, I really believe that, and I, I think it's right that, and I appreciate that at least it's up front and we're working through this, this is, no, you weren't supposed to not hold back that we had a meeting. You were supposed to like, well, we didn't know how it was gonna go. They could have shut us down. They could have been, we didn't know how they were gonna talk. They were, they were like, oh shoot, well, this may be a good idea, right? And so then now we got something to bring back. We had no idea, so it was no strategic intent. It's just the fact that you're communicating that you are part of a bigger region. This closed-minded, don't talk to nobody, don't talk to Atlanta, don't like, that ain't happening with me. But I believe there's the best of both worlds. I believe that there should be, there should be a bedroom community. I've always committed never to urbanize in this. I didn't believe in the big 50 passenger buses. You were in the meeting when it first came up. I'm like, no, don't go big. I was the one who drove like, no, keep this thing small. Let's prove this out. Let's do a pilot program. Let's take our time, right? This was like steady. All the rest of this is just sort of noise. It's like, okay, guys, we gotta go through this thing. But okay, go through the process. Right, let it. But I didn't suggest that going in tomorrow that anything was going to happen. I appreciate Commissioner Mitchell's that it needs to be a recommendation that comes out of committee. I'm not certain I would say change anything with regarding the homes. It's frozen. ARC has seen it. That's what the public has seen. It's like I'm of the position where, thanks for the intelligence, duly noted. If there's a recommendation that comes forth that says that we change homes, great. But if there's not, leave it as is. But at least you got the intelligence, right? At least you got like, okay, it could move. At least they stayed at it and said, okay, could it or could it not? Because it was an issue. It was a valid point. He needed to be heard. Like, okay, it was like a reasonable obje um, um, objection. I don't disagree with Commissioner Moak here, but it's like, okay, but how do we get there? How do we get to a place of compromise, which comment I made earlier? How do we get there? So if it's just simple, okay, can we get to a compromise? Sure we could. 
If it's just simply, ah, that was my reason to say no, but now that we've taken that off the board, it's still no, then okay, then leave it alone. Leave it alone and let it play, right? So that's why I'm like, okay, I won't belabor. I will save my real debates for tomorrow. Madam Chair, you. Okay, thank you so much. Any other comment before I go forward, uh, Commissioner Guider? Uh, yes, um, the study that was just done by a collaborative firm, was it based just on these, I mean, the four routes that we have put out to the public, right? It was, it was based on the four routes, including the HE Homes Direct Express. But um, all their data is concerning those routes. So the public has not had a chance to vet anything else. This board has not had a chance to vet anything else. And um, so all the information that they did was based on the four routes, two of them going out of the county. So did we pay $50,000 for nothing? Well, first of all, we don't have two routes going out of the county. We, I mean, originally there were. There was one going down uh, Riverside Drive into Cobb County. No. No. Nope. No. But it was a direct route to H.E. Homes. We had one going directly to H.E. Homes. And, well, um, and I understand there's a lot of businesses down there, um, Google and, and uh, Medline. We did a tour of their uh, facility. And I, I would like to remind this board that we give them tax abatements. And for years, they do not pay their fair share of the taxes. We do that to bring jobs here. So if they want to ha have a van service, they're welcome to do it to go pick up their employees. In Jacksonville, Florida, the hospital does that. To go, they go around and pick up employees that work there. So it's not necessarily the government's job to provide the transportation for their uh, workers, especially when we give them tax abatements. And I'm talking about big abatement, abatements. But, um, I just feel like the, you know, we've put all this information out to the public and now all of a sudden that whole picture's changed and there's confusion out there because there's confusion on this board. So, um, and if, um, if I had attended a meeting in Atlanta with Martyr and it was brought up in committee, I would have said, yeah, I, I, I instigated that instead of sitting there saying, wonder where that come from. So, uh, you know, you can act innocent if you want to. You can sit in a garage and call yourself a car all day long, but that's not going to make you a car. So I yield. Okay. Thank you. I um, trust that this Transportation Committee will uh, work diligently to uh, certainly look at Route 100 and uh, respond to the citizens of Douglas County with regard to uh, services that uh, will leverage their complaints and concerns. And I appreciate what you've done, Director Watson, to go up far beyond the ordinary to explore other options, um, listening to the outcry. Uh, intermodal means just what it means uh, within the county serving the citizens of that particular county. So I appreciate what you all, in, including the Transportation Committee, has done. Uh, with that being said, I've listened also to the other end of the spectrum with my uh, fellow commissioners uh, who have uh, expressed so diligently today about time. Uh, what type of time do we have in terms of the response that uh, ARC needs to move forward with the CMAC grant? grant because it's, certainly I can, it's nothing immediate. It's nothing immediate no. because what I want to do is certainly allow uh, the Transportation Committee to go back tomorrow and meet uh, at your time that you've already placed on your agenda for tomorrow and meet and then also allow uh, my fellow commissioners to take an opportunity to read this 100 page document I believe that's condensed down to 39 pages but uh, I certainly I would uh, speak to my legal counsel and also my clerk and, and consider a public I would like to call a special call meeting uh, for the for this vote and uh, certainly could not uh, I will allow the rest of this week to play out to allow us to 
to massage everything, get out, allow the commissioners to read. Again, I heard uh, Commissioner uh, Mitchell loud and clear, uh, pump the brakes, allow everybody to read, and, and at least uh, when we vote, we could at least be on one page. I would appreciate that. Uh, Clerk, do you think there's a possibility we could make an announcement for next week to vote? I mean, for this particular item, I want a public uh, special call meeting. Yes, ma'am, we'll just need to look at the calendar. Okay, and I'm hoping that coincides with my fellow commissioner's schedule because I want to do that. And then once we vote, at least my conscience would be clear because, again, I like uh, transparency, uh, and that's very important to me. Also, uh, thank you again for working uh, so diligently. And also, Commissioner Guida had uh, a request, and I want us to fulfill that as well. She wants something in writing from ARC saying that, it's, that the option A and B uh, is something that can be done. Is it possible that we can get something in writing from, from them? Well, uh, we already have an email from them say, saying that we can can adjust our routes if we need to. Could you share that email sure. with Commissioner Guider so she could, sure. she needs something in writing? All right, with that being said, we we'll appreciate your presentation. And tomorrow I will table this item um, so we we'll at least will be uh, prepared. And then also I just want to respect our citizens to make sure that we uh, present good information and vote on good information. So that will be a week from today. And uh, you, that notification will be um, sent out by our clerk. Okay? Thank you. Uh, next we have Mr. Bill Peacock. And we are on tab number 12. Authorization to award a contract to Titus Construction LLC for the renovation of fire station number three for a total cost of $442,894 and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents pending final legal review. Madam Chairman, thank you. Um, this particular bid was uh, a rebid. Um, we had uh, bid this out at, at the end of last year. Uh, the bids were um, higher than we expected, so we did, went back in and did some engineering, value engineering of the scope of work. We're also going to let some county personnel do some of the demolition. That's going to reduce the, the overall expense. Uh, Titus uh, was the low bid. Uh, we've uh, spent, done some research and we're confident that they can do the work. That's covered under the scope. So uh, we're asking the commission to allow us to uh, award the contract to them and negotiate a final contract. Okay, any questions from the board? Pretty uh, self explanatory. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Guider. Uh, yes, Bill, I think our, our workforces are going to do some of the work. Demolition mainly. De demolition yes, mainly. But uh, y'all have had to redraw the plans a little bit uh, or reduce. To, in order to get a reduced cost, right? Uh, we looked at some of the some of the items that were included in the original scope, and we did, as I said, value engineer, which which means reduce some of the expense of some of the items in the, in the scope. The big thing really is, though, that we're going to use our own uh, labor force to do the demolition. That's really what's reduced the price a great deal. Okay, and. Um, so when we, if we award this, if we vote to award this, when would the construction start? We'll have to do a um, quick negotiation of a final contract uh, and then meet with the construction company and see when they could possibly start. I mean, if they could start next week, we, we would be ready. And during the uh, rehab of the building, our, uh, we have a mobile home located on the site that will house the firemen and MTs. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we, we are looking for vendors now to get prices for uh, the lease of a bunk trailer, if you will, that would be used uh, to uh, house the firemen uh, while we do the construction there at the, at the station. So we can lease those, those type trailers? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. I yield back. Okay. All right. We'll move on to the next tab, tab number 13, authorization to approve a contract with Carter Watkins Associates um, Architects for the design and engineering of the tennis courts at Deer Lick Park and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Peacock. Again. Yes, ma'am. Uh, again, uh, uh, we had to rebid this one as well because the first time we bid, I don't think we got any, um, any solicitations in or any bids in. Um, uh, we received two uh, bids. Uh, on this particular project, 
Uh, we have chosen the low bid from Carter Watkins. Uh, we are very familiar with their ability uh, and um, uh, how effective they are at, uh, at working with county governments like ours. So uh, we are asking you to allow us to award the contract for this work to Carter Watkins. Okay. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? No, okay. ma'am. We'll move on. Thank you so much. Pretty self-explanatory. Explanatory. Um, tab number 14, authorization to apply for the hazard uh, mitigation grant for the up next update to the multi-jurisdictional hazard mitigation plan and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Bill Holland. Yes, this, um, this grant is um, FEMA money passed through through Georgia Emergency Management. It is, we're required to have a hazard mitigation plan. It lists our projects that we want to do as money um, becomes available to make our uh, county more sustainable. And like it's one of our requ required plans. And the the, it's a, the amount of the, uh, we applied for was 30,000. We were awarded 24,000. And the match is, uh, this is the breakdown of it's federal, 75% of the amount. 10% state, 15% county. So I think that's 3,600. 3,600. Uh, 3,600 3, 3, um, for the, uh, the county. Okay, $3,600 match. Okay, any questions from the board or comments? Thank you. Thank Pretty you. self explanatory again. Uh, tab number 15 uh, authorization to amend the sheriff's office budget by $4,949 for a donation received from Tailmate LLC for the purchase of a new polygraph <laughs> machine. Uh, Major Holmes, how are you? Good. Good afternoon, y'all. Good. Good afternoon. I'll be brief. Uh, this is a for a polygraph machine that's being utilized by our Office of Professional Standards, uh, John Sweat. Uh, it's also used to do a, a bulk of our hiring and our background information for our new hires. Uh, and it went down on us and broke, so we're very thankful to have the donation to be able to get it up and running because obviously it wasn't a budgeted item. But Okay. Any questions from the board? Comments? Okay. Okay, we don't have any questions. Okay. Thank you. No. <laughs> okay, tab number 16, authorization for the chairman to execute a part-time contract for Deputy Coroner Nathan Womack. Um, uh, Coroner Godwin is not here this morning, I believe, uh, County Administrator Teal, are you going to take it like you did for him? Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, it is what it is. Essentially, it's a uh, part-time deputy coroner um, recommended by Miss um, <coughs> Godwin uh, for uh, Mr. Nathan Womack. Uh, same terms as uh, the uh, other deputy coroners. Okay. So it's a replacement, essentially. Is that what you're saying? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Any questions from the board? All right, we'll move on to the next item. 17 through 21 is, um, that's the approval of our minutes and to, I mean, I'm sorry, of our expenses, and we will discuss those tomorrow. Um, any other discussion from the Board of Commissioners before I call for executive session? Board of Commissioners, at this time, do we have a motion to go? Well, first of all, County uh, Bernard, do we have, uh, Attorney Bernard, do we have? Uh, Ma Madam Chair, you're going to need an executive session for legal, real estate, and personnel, and it's going to be uh, fairly lengthy. So I think what Mark's plan is is to go upstairs and then come back and re uh, and come back and reconvene to finish the meeting down here, so that we stay consistent on the camera. Okay. Thank you so much, um, Board of Com Board of Commissioners. At this time, do we have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. We have a second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Please take a 10 minute break and I'll uh, see you all upstairs in our conference center, conference room. And we will reconvene back down here. Thank you.